Well, welcome back to the Comic Book Historians Podcast with Alex Ran and Jim Thompson. Today, we have multiple Eisner Award-winning writer and artist, Carol Tyler, joining us today. Carol, thank you so much for being here. So happy to be here. Jim and I are going to hopscotch through your life. This is going to be like a this is your life sort of uh, episode. So Jim, go ahead and start it off. Okay, right. so Carol, I, I always like to start with your birth and, and your parents everything it's this is going to be odd compared to normal because usually when i do it we we don't know all the answers or we certainly haven't read stories about everything whereas i'm asking you questions here that i sort of know some of the answers already because they've they've been told in your in your comic strips over the years uh so if when I'm asking you these, feel free to reference the stories, like say, you know, well, I, I told this and in, in we're in my first, you know, story in Weirdo or something like that. It's fine to 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 give footnotes for us here. OK, um, so um, you were you were born in, in well, you, you were uh, grew up uh, up until like age of nine uh, in Chicago. Was that like the north side of Chicago? Yeah, we were um, we lived on Addison Street, which was be between um, Riverview Park and Cubs Field, right on right by the L train. Oh, that's great! So you were you were right there by was it Wrigley Field? Is that what it is? No, we were we're Lincoln Lincoln Avenue. Okay, um, Wrigley was a ways down. Oh, okay. All right. So were you a baseball fan? Oh God. Well, let me just say, um, baseball was so um, present in our lives back then in the 50s. Like everybody played baseball. And you, we, since we lived near the L train and it was crappy underneath there because it was it was these I-beams that went up, you know, an I-beam thing so that the L would be up an elevated train. And so nobody had a house under there. And it was really, you know, it's where people would take their dogs and they'd never pick up the dog poop and there were broken bottles and all that stuff. And that's where we played baseball. And we were always, there was always a pickup game going on because if you played in the street, you know, you could balk a car and somebody would be pissed off. So, um, <laughs> although I, to this day, I remember car, car, C-A-R, which meant get out of the street. You know, we'd be playing stickball or something. Yeah. But you could really hit away under these... Um, under these, under the elevated. Now, and then one of the fun things to do was um, when the train would come by, when the train would be going by, it would stop in a little bit over the, over Addison Street. That was where the station was. So as hard as we could, we'd get up there and we'd try to throw stuff up so that the suction would make it stay up on <laughs> underneath the L train and then it would stop <laughs> and then bonk down on all the cars. Oh no. We didn't do that very often, but because you couldn't really get it up there, you know, we weren't that strong. But it was one of the fun things we always tried to keep doing. So Chicago, well, I lived in Chicago. My parents had a business. They were in the pipe plumbing business, pipe fitters. Your dad and, was a construction plumber, right? Is that well, what it was called? In Chicago, he was doing the whole thing. C Tyler, C. W. Tyler Plumbing. So uh, I found in the stuff going through the stuff when my parents passed away, I found their books that they kept like, you know, somebody had a toilet leaking up on Ashland Avenue or there'd be, you know, Mrs. So-and-so, you know, her drain was stopped up. So my dad had to do all kinds of plumbing stuff. His dad was a plumber. And so he learned the trade before he went into the war. And when they got out and lived in Chicago, they were on Addison my mom did the bookkeeping and payroll and, you know, all that stuff. But all of us kids were, you know, that's, that was the thing. I grew up playing with these elbows and copper pipes and uh, bags of asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because they'd wrap that around boiler pipes. Now, did did he want your brother, uh, your older brother, to go into the business? Did he want him to be a plumber, too? My older brother could not stand anything going on in our family. He was gone. He wanted to play. He wanted to be in sports. Um, he was the guy instigating all the 
the hijinks out on the street. Ah, uh, well, that's right, because he was kind of the leader, wasn't he? The like the leader of everybody um, yeah. in the neighborhood. Yeah. He and my sister, and they hated me because I was the baby that they had to drag along. So um, I was thinking about that. The other, like for example, when when you were with my brother, he'd he'd just say, "Today's test is that we have to get from here to the end of the block and not have our feet touch the ground." And so it'd be like, "What?" So which meant. Climbing and crawling and leaping across cars, garages, trees, everything, por people's porches, because the test was that you couldn't have your feet touch the ground. And there was always something going on like that. <laughs> Weird, fun, but, um, but, uh, but then I had to stay in the yard, so I would do the test on my own. I wasn't included in a whole lot of what was going on in Chicago because I was little. And there was this heavy heaviness of the business. And there was some kind of vibe I've interpreted over the years that they were, you know, they were maxed out, grieving the loss of their first child that never got addressed that I wrote about in the Hannah story. Right. So when when did you when did you find out about about that? Well, I knew Anne existed. OK. All right. But I didn't know what really happened. I mean, I knew she, the story was that she died of burns. So, you know, there you go. She died of burns. And then we'd be in the car and she, my mom, only other time, once in a while, she'd say, the first star in the sky, that's Anne's star. So that was the extent of it. And, you know, we'd see pictures, you look through the photo albums, stuff which I, I show in the Hannah story. I show going through the pictures and asking questions and pretty much being shut down. So it wasn't until she was much older and it was later in life that she opened up. And it happened because she was in a prayer group at her church. And this is this would be 40 to 50 years later that she finally told me the story. And then I was mortified at what really happened. And as I dug deeper, because I wanted to tell us, I wanted to do it as a comic story. And I found out more things and more horrors emerged. I wanted to do something. I was mad. I wanted to sue them or do something, but statute of limitations. I'm going to have to. Does anybody in your family, when you're um, his, historically speaking, has has anyone ever said you are not going to tell this story? This is this is private. Shit. This is mine. No, it's all wide open. Is it really? Who's going to say? Who's going to say? Don't express yourself. I mean, it, no. First of all, the first part, my family of origin, the Tylers, no expectations for me whatsoever. So. Um, when I did tell the stories, I mean, they'd be like, why did you have to make me look like that? Or my sister would say, or some kind of like, fine, if that's what you, the way you see it, that's it. But yeah, it's the way I saw it from my perspective. If you got a beef, you do a comic or you tell it a different way. <laughs> and but, that, that didn't cause any, any long-term frictions. Everybody's, I mean, I realize all families have difficulties, but. Um, I don't think I ever really said anything that was horrible. You know, it was all always um, in with with love. You know, kindly. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're probably harder on yourself than on uh, anybody around you in some ways. Well, I I I'm not in it for the. Um, what did I tell somebody the other day? And I thought, this should be my catchphrase. Well, let me think. I'm not in it to hurt anybody. Um, I'm not in it for the humiliation. I'm in it for the humanity. Yeah. Yeah, that comes across uh, too. Although some of the stories, I, I just read, went and reread your, um, your, um, your All Those Tommies story. 
and and that's a that's a book which is filled with that because that's the very nature of of that. Um, well, it's because that was in a book about uh, assaults. Yeah, and me too. And yeah, I I told about um, just how that it was during those times in the late seven or in the early seventies, late sixties, early seventies to try to come of age sexually. I think I did it okay. Um, the I didn't hurt anybody there except I did call out some people who were behave if they earned that bad behavior, they, they're gonna be called out. That seems that seems fair. I noticed in a lot of those in, in uh Mary Fleener's uh story as well, a lot of times it's not the sexual assault that hurts after all these years as much as the almost the bad manners, the bad, the betrayal uh, that goes along with it. Uh, the, the little details stick in, in your head as much as, 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 as any other aspect of it. Do you think yeah, the double, it was the double standard? In other words, you can't uh, be a fully engaged. You can't be fully engaged, but boy, we can. And if you yeah. do it, we're going to label you. That's what it, mine was about. Um, being labeled as uh, and and losing um, being put down because I was experimenting right. because I you know so the, it became a, a a stigma that I did that was put thrown on me by the men of the time and I thought well you fuckers <laughs> now. When you were growing up, was there a double standard in your house with between your your brother or brothers? Because you also had eventually a younger brother uh, that was what nine years younger than you. Um, yeah, yeah. And and so were they? Did they get treated differently by your mom and your dad than than the girls were? Well, the expectations were that my brother would go into the plumbing business but he didn't want nothing to do with that he wasn't interested in any of my dad's tools my brother Jim was a little bit more interested in the tools and they decided he'll he they decided for him that he'd go into the trades my brother was an athlete so he leaned towards that um my sister joined the convent because you know she was holy <laughs> and I was wild and I wasn't but they didn't know what to do you know they didn't know where to stick somebody they didn't know how to deal with somebody who would was outspoken or like I was very introverted but it, but then I would do something that they considered to be a little bit weird and yeah my dad did say at the table one night I said oh I want to go to college he said you go to college you're just going to get married be some guy's wife why would I send you to college for that and I said okay don't care. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to do it. I'm going to go to college. I just, I had a lot of issues with like being a Catholic girl. But there was just a whole lot of it didn't add up to me. And yeah, so there was that thing about boys and girls. It's true. You know, and boys could achieve. Girls had to become housewives. You need to go take typing and become a secretary. Anyway, yes, there was that um, sense of, uh, I didn't, you know, there was nobody ever said to me, wow, you've got talent. You can draw so well. I'm going to get you a private tutor, which people come to me and they want private tutors for their girls in this day and age. I want to I want to help you achieve. I want to make sure, you know, it just I guess that it just didn't it wasn't on, on that generation to push their girls. I don't know. So when you would win like um, prizes for your like sign design or something, I, I know the, the the one that you you won that you talk about in the Fab Four book. Um, I won. Did, did did anybody um, encourage you at that point and say, "Wow, you really have a gift"? Did the did the nuns at school um, or anyone notice that you could draw really well? Well, they knew it. They knew I could draw, but you know, when girls who drew back then could do nice backdrops paint a nice backdrop for the uh, bake sale. It was like, it was considered an additional skill for a good rounded person who could 
find themselves one day needing to use that skill to make a costume for their children. Uh, of course, that, that makes, that makes mm -hmm. sense. <clears throat> so let, let, we've talked about gender. Let's talk about class a little bit so we get both covered. Um, when you were um, at some point, um, uh, you all left the, the, the north side of Chicago and you moved, um, moved on up, as, as they say on the Jeffersons, to, uh, was it? Moved on out. We moved out. It was, 10, <laughs> it, it was an hour's drive out of the city. Uh, that's it's Fox Lake, the, Illinois. And Nowheresville. And you went to kind of a more upscale school where you were a little bit worried about um, the, the... No, it wasn't upscale at all. It wasn't? Well, no, Chicago had a Catholic school system and we went to the parish school, St. Andrews. And when we moved to Fox Lake, there was a parish school. So I went from one Catholic school to another type of Catholic school. Um, so there was no sense of like... Um, class it was just you were in catholic school okay because i you were, you were a little bit embarrassed about your like it, it, making sure they understood your dad wasn't a bathroom kind of a plumber that was in high school now that oh, that's, was different that's it okay so i'm not wrong i just i got ahead of myself it's when you got into high school and that wasn't catholic school yes it was Catholic school. I, went, oh, okay. I had 13 years of Catholic education. Ah, so it was um, in high school that it was, it was, you were feeling a, a class distinction. Yeah. And that's because the, when I went to St. Andrews, you had the parish school. So everybody in the neighborhood, they all went to the same school. And then when I moved out to Fox Lake, it was local kids out there. all went to the same school, but once it went to high school, there was only one Catholic school in the whole County. And it was right in the middle of the County. So there were buses that would come from all over the county. So you'd have people coming from out in the sticks like me, and then you'd have people coming from larger cities like Waukegan, North Chicago, High, Highland Park, you know, wealthy suburbs on the, the wealthy suburbs included, over on the North Shore, closer to Lake Michigan, which was north of Chicago, there were Lake Forest, there were wealthier enclaves, communities. Yes. And then on the other side of the, on the western side of the county where I lived up near Wisconsin, it was lakes. So there was like fishermen and people with boats, you know, but there was nothing glamorous about it. It was just, you know, very working class. And so we moved out there. That meant that my dad was going to have to commute back into the city because his plumbing ties were still in the city. And my mom had to get a little job local, you know, and keep us kids going and stuff like that. And then we'd get on the bus. We got on the bus and I had to get on the bus at like, quarter to seven in the morning so I could get to school by whatever it took 45 minutes to, almost almost an hour to get to this to school every day do the whole school day then they come home at night and so the the big <clears throat> when I got to high school was wait a minute I'm not in Fox Lake anymore I'm not even in my neighborhood in Chicago there's a big world out there with all kinds of different people from different backgrounds and the first order of business was people had to figure out where you fit. And I didn't really fit because I was a hipster all along. I always felt like I knew what was going on. And my brother was king of sports. And so I had an immediate status. Well, then, woo, because he was the all-time champion of everything. And people idolized him. So just by default, I was you know, in some ways, but at the same time, I was from Fox Lake. And so it's it, it part of the sniping that goes on with people is trying to put you down. And I finally realized I didn't belong in any of those groups. And I don't know, I just kind of became a, like a lot of artists, I became kind of an artist or outsider, uh, always looking forward to the day when I get the hell out of school. <laughs> And we'll we'll save the um, 1965 and the Beatles in that that period for for later on when we'll talk about your your other book. But okay, so that was the time just before high school. That was the end of eighth grade. You know, just before it all turned into that high school angst. So the high high school was was tougher for you in in a lot of ways. Is that right? Well, first thing that first thing that happened was I had a full set of braces put on 
And so I remember just being having a headache all the time, going down to the counselor's office and laying there because they that's back when they would turn to, to move your teeth. I had to have, my jaw was really bad. I mean, it's big now, yeah, but <laughs> so they had to pull teeth and literally move my jaw back. They were supposed to do surgeries. And was, my dad did it as a barter for this guy. Uh, what do you call it? Orthodontist. Yeah. So I would come to school and to just, even go like this and touch the top of my head, it would just radiate with pain. I had so much facial pain that first, my freshman year, I just felt terrible. And yet I was trying to look cool, you know? And uh, I don't know, one day my dad said, uh, or the orthodontist said um, he wanted more work. My, he, my dad put in a bathroom. And the guy said that that wasn't going to cover the cost of the teeth. So just like that, they got all of that. It was supposed to stay on for another year. They just took them off. That's why I have a weird bite because he only got halfway through the job. Because my wow. dad said, hell no, I'm not putting in a kitchen. Not tape, you bathroom. You know, there's a fight over who's what the cost was. So I got stuck in the middle with this terrible grill. But then the pain was gone and I could just, I was quickly able to, to assess what the hell was going on. And I got a lot of more attention being a kind of outsider artist type. Now, with a fucking- usually I ask people um, about their comic influences. A lot of them, have, you know, start reading and they're reading superhero stuff and everything else. I know you weren't, you weren't doing that, but you did read uh, Mad and um, John Stanley's some of his his books, the Nancy and Sluggo, and and mm-hmm. um, all of and those. Mm-hmm. And then obviously you were you you were very into um, Ernie Bushmiller's Nancy strip. Um, yes, 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 absolutely. Because uh, we re- my, my mother always got the newspaper. We were a newspaper reading family, especially at dinner time. You know, there'd be a paper there, and so that's when I would read Nancy. Was it weird? Was it weird going from the Bushmiller Nancy to the Stanley Nancy with the, I mean, because they're two very different stories in a lot of ways. Were you reading Nancy when it was the, the Uma goose pimple, you know, yeah, like the goose weird, pimple. Yeah. yeah goose pimple. I love her. Yeah. Um, I'll, and I know I was reading Stanley in Chicago because one of the stupidest fun things I ever did, and I still love it. <laughs> Cause I had no power and my brother didn't let me read his comics at all. Of course. So the whole super thing was like stupid to me anyway. I mean, I knew there were jokes inside the bazooka comics, the bazooka gum. They always seem pretty lame. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> oh, so I didn't care. But when I read Nancy goes to summer camp, I was about as far away from the country as you could be living in Chicago there on Addison Street. I told you with the crappy, crappy lots. Well, the alleys were also equally as crappy, stunk, garbage. But they were the alleys were set up so that you'd pull in there and you could get into your garage because the other side would be a main thoroughfare of the street. So the blocks were set up in such a way in Chicago that there'd be a main street Somewhere halfway between that and the alley, there was a thing called the gangway where you could cut through so you didn't have to go all the way around. And you'd be in the alley, then you'd find the gangway to the next front street and so on. You'd go through the whole city of Chicago going through gangways. So I got this idea one day after being completely de- demoralized by my siblings and thinking, wait a minute, I was kept thinking about summer camp. My parents were not going to be sending me to summer camp, but I thought maybe I could go to, I could have a pretend summer camp. So I got a towel and I put a t-shirt in it and I rolled it up like a bedroll. And then I made um, a sandwich. I I don't remember. It could have been either bologna or sandwich spread. (laughs) I don't think it was peanut butter. It was some probably a bologna sandwich with ketchup on on uh, white bread and i probably folded it up in wax paper 
And then I went through two gangways to an alley. And I thought, this one will do. And I found the front <laughs> of somebody's garage where it was set back from the alley, just a little, just enough for me to put down that towel and eat my sandwich. And I thought I was at summer camp, just like Nancy. And in my mind, it was the summer camp from the, the big specials. Remember, they make the fat. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that, to me, was the ultimate thrill, that I was at Camp Fafa Mama. That's no worse than any other camp story I've ever heard. So, so I think it's... <laughs> it was totally stupid. Could you imagine seeing a kid walking with a towel and eating a bologna sandwich? And that's what I did. And I was thrilled. And it's amazing because ever since that comic, I had breeze in my head thoughts. You know, I did a comic in, I think it might be in the reproduced in late bloomer called uh, little cross hatch mind. Yeah. That's in there. Yeah. That's the one with, that's the one with Nancy in it, right? Yeah. I talk about how the, the way they, they drew the screens on the summer camp buildings at camp Fafa mama. And just the idea that there would be a building that was all screens something about that so I've always been attracted to screen doors and just the idea of that yeah you know. and there's also a bit of a discussion of like Nancy versus Lulu in that too I, I, in that I in that because my mom said you like Lulu all the way and I remember reading Lulu and she you know I made it into a punchline with yeah. the feet going out of the frame the, yeah the which panel. I mean they're, they're they're kind of they're different but I could see what you I could see how there'd be a I actually kind of messed them up too a couple times before. So well, I I didn't even know. I didn't even know the ownership. I didn't understand authorship. So yeah. I would read that and I was interested in the character. Right. And then it was like sometime later I'd say, that looks a little different than the one I see in the paper. And then <laughs> it was the, you know, Bush Miller by Ernie Bush at the top in the big bold letters. And then it took me years to figure out that somebody else drew that. How, how could that be, you know? And then it was, oh, the character. The character is the same. It was a little different. But right. I right. didn't really put the name John Stan. I didn't I, I didn't understand that, that that was. But, but also on the, um, the Lulu was like almost like situational uh, comedy, right? Like a sitcom, whereas uh, Nancy, yeah. there was all these like funny geometric, like breaking the fourth wall things that were going on all the time in that um well the the, the bushmiller nancy when i got when i got on that i thought i mean to me it was like perfection this right. guy could nail a gag in three yes. panels absolutely Boom. yep and you could read that and get the wholeness of that world you could get the moment you got the characters it was such great writing and the, the brevity of it it was perfect yeah and for me a challenged reader I didn't, you know, I'd look at the other stuff on the page, like Mary Worth, or be like, oh, it's so boring. No, yeah, I also right. like uh, Nancy's head shape. I like a circle face. <laughs> well, I mean, there was, there, I got it. I get this, you know. I didn't yeah. have to, and I mean, I would like, I would look at the other stuff. I didn't like serialized the serialized work. I liked that it was done and done, you know, here's the strip, here's the joke, uh, you know, next. And that kind of has carried on into my work when I do, like when I was do, started doing weirdo stuff, I realized I had to have the joke in one page. So with Bushmiller, when I learned, it's all about the timing. It's all about the setup and the timing, you know, it's all about that. So Putting that, I that thought that wait, I got, I got X amount of real estate here, and I got to make something happen, and I got to set this up, and I got to deliver. Yeah, both both of them. Stanley had a great comic timing too, in terms of setting up the joke. You could just see it. He, he did have as it was coming. Yeah, he but different ways. Um, I could so, not stand Archie comics. My sister read those. It'd be like the boring, here we go, what's going to happen at Riverdale High this week? I just could not relate. Yeah. 
Well, that's interesting. I mean, so you you never had now was it partly the did you just not care about the the teen th- that particular genre or was think, it just the, the 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 actual skill of the the lack of skill of the uh of, of the gag my sister liked it therefore i did not like it ah that makes sense too i got that and she, she was a she was a old she was a, reading it in her teens and so there was nothing that i was going to be repulsed by more than her stuff so was she playing like sugar, sugar in the house and all that? My sister was holy, but then she'd say things like, and she, she would listen to the radio. Yeah. And she was overweight. She was unhappy. I found out later. She had a lot of responsibility thrown on her, but she was very quick to remind me how, what a flake I was, you know, She'd say, what's the name of that gas station? We'd be in the car. What's the name of that gas station right there? And I'd say, Sinclair. She'd go, oh, you're going to hell? You told Claire to sin? Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> I'd just be mortified. <laughs> so She was holy. She was official. Right. And I, didn't, I, I never believed. I, here's, you talk about feminism? I remember sitting in church when I was little, little thinking, how come it's God the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost are all guys? And then the woman is over here in a little special extra area by her. How come there's no, why didn't he send, why didn't she send? Ah! So I just, I never bought into the whole thing. Yeah. I couldn't believe that if half, you look around the church, half the people in here are girls, women, ladies. The male priest, male servers, men, 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 men. Oh, there's Mary over there. And we're supposed to adore her. She's perfect. I just didn't. I didn't get it. So you, um, your your brother goes off to college at Dayton, and then you want to go to college too, and you're you don't have the same exactly the same uh, options that that uh, he does. And you no. end up going. You end up going to Tennessee. Tell yep. us how how that happens. Because I didn't have any counseling or help. Like today, a counselor would try to find me a get me in placed in a school with art. But the counselors back then, it didn't work like that. It was you were kind of on. There was no school counselor. You were kind kind of on your own. Although I just said I was down at the counselor's office with bad, painful mouth. But truly, um, I don't know. I just didn't. I didn't get the right kind of thing. And there was no money. There was none of this. You can do it with scholarships. I had absolutely zero confidence in myself. I didn't do well on the SAT course. You know, I had trouble. I had problems with reading comprehension i could do math i was good at art but when they would give you those read this paragraph and now answer the questions about what just happened in the paragraph just seeing that gray box of text frightened me so i always did poorly on these tests you mean like if there's like an essay that you had to read and then answer multiple choice the essay part was like um that was that's the part you're talking about i would just go yeah but if i had to figure out if i walked outside and saw that water was coming off the building funny and i'd have to figure out a way to drain it from the in other words my engineering skills were through the roof i could i could figure anything out i could modify things i invented things i could see things in my mind but the, the the matrix back then, the, the thing was, you have to do it this and you have to do that. Mm-hmm. They were going to label you. Perfect example was when I was in kindergarten, I could see music in my head. I could hear it. And I, I would make, make up songs. And so let's see if she could learn to play the piano send me over to sister so-and-so. She sat me down in front of the keyboard and she said, this is middle C. All right, I just showed you where's middle C. Now find middle C, find middle C, find middle C. And I could, I could hear her saying that. And to me, that was music. And then 
And then it was like, oh, she wants me to hit a key. I don't know what she's talking about. So the nun turned around and told my mother that I had no musical ability whatsoever. But yet I had just composed a song based on her yapping at me. <laughs> and to this day, I have that happen where I'll, I'll wake up and I'll have a complete song or something in my head. And But I can do that. But I've, I've been taking this little app trying to learn how to play the piano by reading notes again. And I can't do it. I cannot read notes. But I can compose music as much as I could. That's why I like it out at my farmhouse. I have to figure everything out. How to fix things. I've taught myself electric. Of course, plumbing is easy. Did, did you, uh, your first school when at college now, that's, was that Tennessee Tech? Was that the first one? Yeah. Okay. And you went there and then we, 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 we will talk about the Tommies, all the Tommies that went there. Um, but you, you, you didn't stay there and, and was it there or at, at the next school that you met your first husband? No, it was a tech. It was at tech. And he was, he was tech. like a big man on campus. He was the ugliest man on campus. It was called the ugly man contest and the fraternities had this ugly man thing. And I was, <laughs> there was hardly any women at this college cause it was a technical college. Now, I was not there for engineering. I knew I was going to go for a couple of years and then transfer ultimately. And I just did it because it was, I could commute. My grandma died. And so I used the money to get a car and I commuted to uh, this school that had cheap, it was cheaper. See, I, I didn't, I didn't pass any of the tests. I didn't get any scholarships. So I ended up paying full fare at tech until we established my residency right away. Drove to the campus. I just took the classes and right away, one of the art teachers said, what are you doing here? You're really, really good. You should not be at a technical school. And I said, really? She said, you're really good. Why don't you try UT? So I did, but, and just before I went to UT, that's when I met Alex, my first husband, Bob. And that was around 1970 or so? Yeah. And, and you guys got married. You you did what your father what your father said. You you went to school and you got married. <laughs> I found a husband. Yeah, found me. <laughs> and you guys were together for about five five and a half years. Yeah, five six years. We were together through uh, songs in the key of life. We started out with um, maybe Derek and the Dominoes. You hear what I'm saying? We, I can run through the albums of my marriage. He loved the Moody Blues. I hated the Moody Blues. Search for and, the last chord. Never again. And he was he was a water quality control engineer and yes, and a stoner dealer. And were you doing any art at all during this five yes. years? Yes. Yes. We would get ripped on hash, or what's that stuff called? Hash oil. We. we oh sure. <laughs> But we would get ripped. And I have pictures of me somewhere. I would lay these pages down on the, I started doing comics. Uh, they were wordless, we, or just a few words, a few characters, and they were completely nonsense. But everybody would go, whoa, that is weird. Whoa, that's so weird. I was just always painting uh, strange. Th I like the, you know, album art. I like yes and stuff like that. You know, I like looking at that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah. Um, so I did some trippy shit. <laughs> but then uh, we moved to Is this Nashville. influenced by, by under, under, underground comics of the time? Because you were. Yeah, well, I'd see them. We'd see them because all the stoners, you know. Well, actually, back. Back in the uh, when I first went to college, and back in the stoner early stoner days, they were around. You know, you people would have these stuff, and I remember looking at. Well, there was a summer that I moved <clears throat> back up to Chicago area, back out to Fox Lake. The summer of seventy, I got back with my high school sweetheart. He had a hippie van. And all we did was get stoned, rock, 
rock the van and go to concerts while I worked at the sausage store. For some reason, <laughs> I'm imagining uh, the mystery machine from Scooby-Doo, and it's like Daphne and Fred in the van. Is that kind of what's going on? Scooby-Doo's after my time. <laughs> I didn't see that. Well, that came out in, like, I think, six oh, bread truck. Yeah. It was a bread truck. It was a bread oh, truck. Okay. The last place I left off with television was... Um, what was that show? I was just thinking of it the other day. Well, there was the good time hour with uh, Sonny and Cher. You know, when I went off to college, I didn't watch any television. So it abruptly ended in like mid 1969-ish. And um, it was uh, oh, Rowan and Martin's laughing. Okay. And then <laughs> no TV. So when you, I, I missed the whole six. Most of 69, all of the 70s TV, I missed it all. I think that's fine. Watergate's overrated anyway. It's totally yeah, fine. it was too, it was too, it was uh, too hard for me to get to a TV set. Right. It wasn't the thing to do. So anyway, when I was with this guy, yeah, it was all about the stone scene. And we would go to rock concerts and people there were reading comics and stuff like that. And I saw all that stuff, but just like I told you a little bit ago, I didn't spend time figuring out who did what, except for one artist. I liked Robert Armstrong's Mickey Rat because it was a parody. Right. Like Mickey Rat. Um, but all of that, all that stuff, Crumb, I, I remember seeing Crumb stuff. It didn't log in so much. I didn't get into the sex fantasies so much. Uh, it's just the stoner stuff, you know, it's appropriate. For, it, 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 again, it was like all these, it's like those guys are really cool. <laughs> you know, making the the cool stuff that those guys draw. And so you were you were uh, you were looking at like underground comics though at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Drawn by cool. the cool guys. Yeah. So Zap and all that. You were you were checking that out. They're all just one monolithic. Those guys. Nice. That's cool. So so oh. when did you when did you read Binky Brown for the first time? Was it when mm -hmm. it came out? Not till a time? long time later. That was eight nineteen eighty one. I so my first foray into underground was as a stoner hanging out with hippies and it was just more for the masses to to consume i'll tell you what i really liked there was a thing called the whole earth catalog and oh, yeah. I would sit there, yeah you could sit there and read that and then across the bottom there was a story that was going across every page across the bottom I used to love that. I used to love to read that. But my drawing was, I worked at the Lake County Regional Planning Commission. So my skills were used on a drafting board, creating zoning case files for uh, people that wanted to do zoning changes in the county. So I'd, I'd have to go through the maps and prepare plats and do overlays. And I learned all about the graphic materials that I use today, inking and everything. Leroy lettering set and all that working at the Lake County Regional Planning Commission. And I was their zoning case file preparer. And that was from 72 to like 74. It all went kablooey because I was married, but there was a guy who worked there that I just, I could not describe, but I had feelings for. Now I realized I had, you know, we were like hot for each other, but he was married too. And so going to work changed from like, you know, making a nice line, perfect. Press on lettering to, he's over there. Oh my God. It finally ended up, I had like a nervous breakdown and, and had to leave work because I didn't know what, I didn't know what was going on in my head. It turned out I was miserable. I was miserably married and I, I was, um, I didn't want to admit I liked this guy. It didn't matter because my husband was cheating on me all the time anyway. <laughs> yeah, Separate. that's what I had read. Now, did is that when you left left that marriage, is that when you went to Middle Tennessee State or was that well we moved to Nashville. Ah, that's right. You that's moved to fact. Nashville. Hey, let, let's move to Nashville. You know, he, he got a job with the state of Tennessee and uh closer to his family and my family had a house in Tennessee and 
There was a three bedroom house that we got. One bedroom was ours. One bedroom was his. The middle bedroom was mine to do whatever I like. And so I piled it up with my art supplies and I would walk in there and say, and shut the door. I didn't know what to do. Because I hadn't met myself. And so when I started to go back to school, while I was in Nashville, commuting down to MTSU, I met people out there down there who were fully committed to doing our work. And I thought, that's who I am. So no wonder I can't, I can't be married and going into the room and doing some art and coming out and making like a beef roast. Doesn't it didn't add up for him and his fucking stoner friends? So that's when I had this idea that like I gotta leave him, and the songs in the key of life came out. And it was to the backdrop of that that uh, I left, and at MTSU I found my my I found something called. Uh, personal vision of what it is I wanted to do. Like when you're stoned, you're going to make bullshit stoner art, right? Or when you're doing this or that and school going to do a poster or do what the assignment is or whatever. But here I was in school given, and the, the way forward was express yourself, do it, do what you like. And so I, that's, that's where it all started. That's where I started to be an artist in 75. So it, tell us about, because I love this story about how you decided to leave the South and how it connects with your brother and the Olympics and all of that. Okay, so I was at MTSU and I had a great three years there. And I learned a lot from the people there, I had made great friends. And I was one of the guiding stars. Cool. Yeah. And so I was with people who didn't do what the professors said, we did what we wanted. And so we invented a bunch of shit and we all ended up turning out to be pretty great artists. Anyway, um, yeah, I got out of school, I decided to do the census. I did that, I made a bunch of money, I was gonna go out to Mexico and do the census. Remember, I am a registered census taker from the 1980 census. It occurred to me that I have to wait 70 years from 1980 till I can look at my own work, but I made a bunch of money. It was amazing. Great census taker. I was out of school by then. And then I decided to go live in Knoxville. I guess where I lived? I lived in a house owned by Johnny Knoxville's mother. <laughs> I didn't know that until years later. And then John Lennon got shot. While I was yeah. in Knoxville, and I went, "Ho, oh, what am I doing in Knoxville?" Oh, I wanted to grieve. I wanted. To, I was so enraged. I just. I tried to make art. I had no money. I turned in my cans of beans so I could buy red, yellow, blue, and black and white. And I took cardboard and I made pictures about it. And I got into graduate school, and that's how I got the fuck out of. Tennessee, hmm. but um, there was also the 1980 Olympics. And my brother was in, both my brothers are in the bobsled team, except uh, my brother made USA sled one. Jimmy came in third. He lost by an eyelash hair. It was terrible. It was very excruciating for him, but he made the 84 team. And so it was like, wait a minute, I could go to the Olympics and I could stay at his house and I could live up there and work there and I did I think now I know put your hat on right Tyler the Olympics came in the winter and it was after the Olympics that I went to back to Tennessee and that's when I did the census and then from there I flipped over to New York or uh, I flipped over to Knoxville and that's when John Lennon got shot and that's when I said I'm going back to graduate school so you see that <laughs> these events these things really propelled me because it's like, what are you going to do? You're going to stay with this guy? Is with this guy? You're going to move to New York? Is he coming with you? You're going to do this? You're going to follow a guy along your whole life? What are you doing? And I always wanted to do my own thing. Find a way. 
you know, a, a, follow something. And I just, the idea that I could go work at the Olympic Games was incredible. I got the job being, uh, first they hired me as a children's art coordinator, but then I had my eye on the prize, which was to hang the show. There was a, the thing about the Olympics in 1980 was they, it was the first year that they brought sport and art together for what was called the whole man. And they used Da Vinci's arts and sport. And so they had a complete art exhibit. They had a fine arts center up there. And I noticed that they were gonna have paintings by some of my favorite artists. And I thought, you mean I get to hold in my hands a Susan Rothenberg? You mean I can hold an Eric Fischel? <laughs> you mean I can hold a Don Nice in my hands and help hang that show? So I got that children's art thing done in a snap and right away focused my attention on working at that fine art center. And I, yes, I got to look at up close and personal all the paintings and all the artwork and everything I ever loved of the my art stars. And then uh, that got done and they said, we need somebody to co coordinate the closing ceremonies. Now look, I saw everything. I saw Eric Hyden win his seven gold medal. I saw this, I saw that, cause it was small. And I was hitchhiking up there cause it was a small town. It was loaded with snow, nobody could get around, but I could get around. I lived up there. Well, they need somebody to do the closing ceremonies. Okay, I'll do that. What does that mean? I get to meet Chuck Mangione. <laughs> I met every athlete under the in the whole wide world. And guess what? Oh, my brother shows up here. Here's two tickets for this hockey game. Hockey game? I can't go to a hockey game. I got work to do. I got to meet. So I got to take the Yugoslavian ski ski team, ski jump team. They got to be at practice. All right, I'll drag my ass over to this again hockey game. So I'm sitting there, and it's the game where the U.S. beat the Russian team. Most amazing hockey game in the history. I know! Just absolutely. Anyway. So, so let's get you. Let's get you to California. I mean, you start doing some some trips. Your boyfriend from um, uh, from the, the south stop, comes up. Stop. I need to tell you, it was during this time before I moved to California. It was during this whole, this, this is a very important time because I was doing artwork all, all along. I remember being up in the, at the Olympics doing, uh, they had a little fanzine and I was doing artwork for that. And then I started doing kind of like adding the words and making sure that everything I said, all the narration was added to the panels. So even though I loved fine art, I was really starting to add the gr graphic element and stuff I'd learned as a, as a, zoning case preparer. I was putting that into my paintings. My paintings were very narrative. I was telling stories. I was doing stand-up comedy. I was doing all that stuff before um, I ended up, you know, getting through with graduate school. In graduate school, I was doing minimalist uh, new image type paintings with language. With words. Yeah, I, I saw a reference to that. You were you were doing narratives even in single panels during your yes. art and things. Um, right. I was just curious about. So your your boyfriend comes up and he goes to School of Visual Arts. He's not at Syracuse, and he, no, he's not. In, he didn't enroll in school. He crashed. Oh, he was he was. Classes. That's right. He was taking classes. Yeah. And he made connections such that that allowed the two of you to do, go on summer trips out. Uh, you got uh, the addresses for people like uh, uh, Griffith and, and Justin Green. All the, all the SF people. Yeah, because there was that one summer that I said, I'll be damned if I'm going to stay down here in the Lower East Side with you. We'll end up murdering each other. So I'm going out to be with my roommate from Tennessee. She's living in... Um, in a house full of women in San Francisco. I'm going out there. And while I'm out there, I'm going to look up all these people. And that, that sort of sets a course for your, your life at that point, because you make these connections that are going to follow through to your next stage that we're going to get to in a minute, which is working at Weirdo, doing uh, actual comics for Weirdo and, and stuff. But you meet Justin Green at that point, and there's some confusion between um, him, your your relationship with him, and your relationship with your 
your uh, boyfriend at the time? Well, when I went out there, I was there to see with my friend Mary and be, and yeah, I was going to go see all these people. And I met them all. I met like, you know, I'd call up one. And, hey, hi, I'm, my name is Carol Tyler. I'm from Syracuse. I don't know, look at my, I love, I love Zippy, you know, and they would be like, oh, great. Okay, bye. I'd call Spain. You know, I'd call different ones thinking fangirl all the way. I called up Justin. He said, oh, well, how about lunch? <laughs> he was on the, mm, yeah, let's see. Here's a girl coming in here. Let's see what this is about. So <laughs> I met him at a sign job. We had sandwiches. We went for a sandwich. He was working Tommy's joint. He was different. You know, he was interested in me personally, not just like, oh, yeah, hey, fangirl. Yeah, I'm good. And, and had and at that point you had read his book oh yeah oh and and that was another i mean that's a gigantic influence in what you you've the kind of comics that you were going to tell correct well because i thought wait a minute this guy's from chicago i'm from chicago hey look he's catholic i was catholic so i got all the jokes and i got all the letters a lot of inside chicago stuff you know that Unless you're from that area, you probably wouldn't get spitting on the Winnetka sign, you know. There was just some things about Midwest life that just went like, yeah, I get this. I got this. So um, when I got out there, that's what we talked about, you know. And, of course, he was on his best polish and being swell. And I was, of course, you know, googly-eyed and amazed that I actually got to meet the guy who wrote Binky Brown. And he was very much presenting himself like the suburban boy that he depicts in the book and I never could think I thought oh he's probably not as fucked up as that character he did <laughs> <laughs> but you were can't, wrong he can't be that fucked up <laughs> <laughs> and and there we go I and then you guys have a daughter together in 1985 no that's not where we go I had to go back to Oh yeah, no, I I know you go back and, and you don't know where with this other guy and forget Justin and be with this other guy until Justin shows up and there's a big fight and then I ended up in San Francisco with Justin. I mean, there's a lot in between there. There's a lot of me helping this other guy. I helped this other guy get launch his career, but you never hear about that. Um. Ah, yes, that was that was very frustrating to you once you had your baby, right? It's, um, um, uh, that's right. that's a made that's the outrage yeah. story. Yeah, and we'll, we'll a, talk about that, that story. What was that guy, Roy, or something? But yeah, yeah, I, I, I read about that. Roy, you, you had that in a story. Yeah, but we'll talk about that story because that that's a a great one. Um, so Alex, let's let's get to weirdo. All right. So then, I um, mean, you, know, you started doing stories for weirdo published by Last Gasp. And for our listeners, just a quick review. Weirdo was a humor comics magazine started by Robert Crumb that ran for about 27 issues from 81 to 90, plus a final issue a few years later. Before talking about your own experiences and work there, what would you say about just Weirdo in general? Um, were you familiar with it before contributing to it? No, I just knew that after the underground scene that there were these anthologies and I got, became familiar, familiar with Arcade. And then when I lived in New York City, um, there were a couple of times I'd go to Art Spiegelman's place hmm. with Francoise. And we would hang up raw posters and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I did my time in the trenches with helping raw. I was aware of Miles and of the struggles that he would discuss. You know, our Art would talk about you know, things that were issues for him. It was nice to have that. And then you'd go to a Jean-Michel opening. <laughs> it, was the, it was the scene in New York. But when I got to, uh, so I, I, it was through that network of that that I became aware of the, who was doing what in comics like. And then when I got out to San Francisco, um, Justin was not interested in that scene at all. He was doing... He was doing childcare because he had a kid. 
and signs. And so it was on me to seek out things. So I did um, like something, a letter to the house that would say, burrito party, come on down. Ron Turner would have a burrito party. Burrito, okay. Mm -hmm. Every year. His famous burrito parties. And so I'd say, Justin, we got an invitation to go. He said, I'm not going to that because Justin has no interest in social anything. Mm -hmm. so can, can I go? Yeah, you can go. So why not? So I go, I, I started making the scene. And when you make the scene, that's when you meet this one and this one and this one and this one. And that's how I met this one and this one. This one did that. And then it was like, mm, you want to see some comics somewhere? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure, cool. Send them in, you know, let's see you what brought you some, got. You brought, you brought art with you. Yeah. Yeah. I always have my portfolio. And um, yeah. And that's, it just, that was, and then I think we had a, we had, an open, we had an open house when I first moved out to San Francisco. Everybody came over. I have a drawing table set up. Justin had his set up. I, thought, I wish somebody had taken videos of that. But that turned into a disaster because an old girlfriend of Justin's was there, and he had unfinished business. And so they were yakking it up over that way. <laughs> I was mad sitting by my drawing table, but I was sitting there with Bill Griffith and you know, Spain and, all, you know, it's like oh, a perfect, a perfect array of people that, you know, I wish I could talk, get around a table today. So um, they were like, don't worry about him. You know, he's just being Justin and be like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know the guy. I just knew some stuff from his comics. And so it's kind of like the way it's been with us. I do my thing. He does his thing. He does. He did signs. He had a kid, and soon I was expecting, and we had a kid, and oh, uh, pretty much he lives in his realm, and I live in my realm artistically completely, because he is he, he was set, and I said to him, "I'm meeting you late in your life, you know, at that time, 37, 38. I can't expect you to." change because of me and I'm who I am and I've been around do, looking for my art and trying to do my thing I got my I kept my maiden name I don't want to be Mrs. Green I just want to be who I am and tell right. my story do your own thing yeah it's been the way it's been so and we don't we don't get together we don't say like hey come over here and look at this panel what should I do nope Although I have often coughed up a punchline when he was doing the sign game. Yeah. He'd be at the table going, okay. I was like, all right, come on, come on the script. Well, the guy comes in and I'd say, I'd think about it for a while. And then I thought, then I'd go, here's what you need to say. That deliver. So I should have been a gag writer because <laughs> I always can come up with that gag. <laughs> or at least that that thing that pulls it together at the end you know right right the punchline just um, like Bush, Bushmiller I'm not comparing myself to Bushmiller but I like the way he would t tighten it up or he would wrap right. it up make it clean yeah clean exit um yep. when uh so then when you were um contributing to Weirdo then and you kind of met people at the party you started in contributing uh your stuff they, it sounds like they saw they liked what you were what you were showing in your portfolio. So you contributed some stuff and what it was under alien commence Kraminsky crumb that, that it, uh, your stuff was then uh, you submitted your stuff over to weirdo. Is that right? Yeah. And I think I had the feeling that there weren't a whole lot of people submitting. <laughs> okay. That, so that was maybe. kind of a nice, there was actually an opening probably for some material. We have an opening for a girl just like you. Yes. <laughs> uh, no, I, it, people were submitting it just was a dull time you got to remember the the 60s and then there was the hippie time and then gerald ford came in and everything dropped like a thud disco was going on people were sh are doing cocaine and so that just kind of pulled the rug out on a lot of stuff like and creatively how, people were too coked out to create uh, there was a lot of coke and 
comic books were weird. They were printed on glossy stock and they were overproduced. And I just, oh, I hated that. Uh, that that was the furthest thing from my mind was anything comic book like that mm. and art was uh had had come out of this uh abstraction period and it was starting to come back into figuration and so things were really getting different and michael jackson was back right okay <laughs> That's great that he's factored into this somehow. I like that. Um, so then you, your first issue of Weirdo was Weirdo 18. And that was the first one that Alien Kermitsky Crumb edited. That was in fall of 1986. Then you did, yet yeah, some of your pieces show up in 20 to 25 and 27 to 28. So what was it like to be a painter working with colorful things and now to then distill it into a black and white um, kind of... Uh, kind of story delivery did that did you have to change how you're expressing it and fit it into a black and white framework or was that easy for you because you were already into strips that were black and white i had to learn all over again because okay, for me color has always been um a vehicle for emotion mm -hmm. right exactly and i had a sense of they had assignments and so now it's like all that stripped away and now you just got to draw it. I had to really find my way back into drawing. And I noticed when things got printed that, oh, there you are, Tyler, trying to make paint strokes. It doesn't work graphically. You, if you're going to be graphic, you got to go graphic. You can't halfway be in color with your mark making. So that meant getting very rigid kind of like, you know, um, less expressive. Right. I kept trying to figure out a way to be expressive. And then it started shaping the panels and it started doing this and that. I mean, I'm sure you've seen how my work has evolved mm -hmm. because once drum scanners were invented and you could, the technology allowed uh, these comic book publishers doing um, independent stuff, they could afford to do color because it became low cost, whereas before cost was prohibitive. So we had to do everything in black and white. The only thing color was the cover. And I was never given any, maybe one or two cover jobs. I always went to, well, Robert had all the weirdo covers, but um, over the years, I just, I never got any covers. Then I just assumed that meant I wasn't strong enough. But that's also during the time when I was known as Ann Moore. Hmm. Oh, you, you, know, um, you did do that women's um, comics, um, uh, the final cover yeah. on uh, issues. Did men. Yeah, I was given the honor of that. And I, I love that. I wanted to do more, but, but um, it just didn't pull out that way. And I had a kid and I got it. I had to have work, you know, I, she had asthma. I had to have health insurance. <sighs> right. Yeah. Domestic demands are, are serious. Um, now, your first story in issue 18, Four Red Brides, did you have a sense of what you wanted to bring to Weirdo? Or, or do you feel like you were still kind of a work in progress at this point? Or do you yes, feel like. Yes, absolutely. Because um, even though I could tell a great story, yeah. Um, I could tell a good story like stand up comedian style, too. I always kept, I had crowds that would listen to me tell my stories. It was amazing. And then, um, and I did performing and stuff like that. So now I got to do it in the comics form. And what I did with Four Red Brides, I just kind of half-baked idea, I don't know. And again, the technically it didn't work because mm -hmm. I was still kind of trying to bridge the gap between, um, am I gonna do it graphically? I never really wanted to give over to that. Man, I'm looking for a hair tie. I never fully wanted to give over to that, you know? I didn't want to give up the painterly marks. I really liked a brush. Right. And I didn't like the rigidity. I don't like doing perspective. There were a whole bunch of things like that that I'd see Justin over there working and he'd be like, I'd be like, oh, it's so 
dry and harsh, you know, and maybe he can pull that off. I was so glad when the color did come because then I could, you know, start with be a more. smush. Yeah, yeah. And then right. Express more, be more yourself. I want to show wind. How do you show wind? It's hard to show wind with black pen marks. Oh yeah. You can go like that. But I wanted to show, you know, a certain thing. And then I had to, I'm still figuring this out. I'm still trying to draw everything. It's like, and as I'm getting older and work, the stuff I'm working on now, it's like the, the book I'm working on now, this is after Soldier's Heart. Guess what? All black and white. I've gone back to black and white because, and I'm, and now it's like, how can you do this? You never learned that lesson. So now you're going to ace it or you can get out of here. (laughs) So it's almost a challenge also, but, uh, but it's interesting. It's just kind of what in your, you're in the mood to, to do also. So then uncovered property in 1987, I thought it was a fun story and it kind of goes to what you were saying earlier about in your family, girls being treated, treated different than boys um, bit of the devil's standard and the shirt being off and how that's different between the siblings um, and that you had this uh, Marilyn Monroe reference in the story. So at this point, were you thinking, you know, I want to make, I, I like autobiographical. Were you basically thinking, you know, autobi- autobiography is kind of what I want to be doing uh, comic wise? It was never a conscious decision. I just knew I could never do that superhero thing. Right. Because... I just saw my family as characters all always. And maybe it's because as it, you know, the child that was told to shut up and I spent a lot of time under tables, just watching people or, you know, how it is for the little one, sit down and shut up. I just always observed and um, couldn't get a word in edgewise. So I'd listen. And it seemed interesting enough to me. So in a way, it was almost like a lot of the responses or observations you made finally were able to find a voice uh, because back then, as they were happening in real time, you you were probably what kind of repressing a lot of that. Would you say that? You mean like when I was growing up? Yeah. I, I was just watching the adults. You know, I was just tuned in. Uh, those shows would come on TV and it's like, what's the difference between the honeymooners and like my parents? None. There's no difference. Look at them. He's, you know, I'd sit back and just watch. My mom would be at the sink and my dad would want something. She'd get it out of the refrigerator and my sister would like kick my brother. So it's like, this is a TV show. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, it, interesting also, cause uh, you know, you're a professor and you do talks and things, but there was one uh, story, 1987 pork chops, there's like high art gallery people and how they can build almost like a fake fame. And there's a comedy around that. So it sounds like you still have this almost like down to earth approach as you observe people. Um, Even if they're in this kind of high art status, you still can almost somewhat reduce them to a a comic absurdity, right? Well, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, Help me figure this out because when you observe people, mm-hmm. like the other day I was in the car with Justin and he said, oh, look at that guy up there. The thing I like about it is you can really, if, if you're parked here, it was at Kroger, you can really see because of the high sidewalk, you can really see these characters mm-hmm. walking. I need to come back with my sketchbook. And I said, I would never come back here with my sketchbook. I don't need to do that. All I need to do is tune into what I know. I've, it's in my head. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Uh-huh. I don't need to sketch at Kroger. All right. There's right. nothing walking by that I can't. I, I'm not saying um, I'm above that, but, and I do need information. Yeah. Sure. I mean, uh-huh. if I just drew a panel about my brother's throwing, chairs into a dumpster <laughs> it was like how many times have you seen a dumpster and you know what they look like yeah but i had to look and then it was like i couldn't find the one that was in my mind's eye oh interesting yeah so he's sometimes there's a, still a need for reference somewhere so everything i saw i didn't like 
So I ended up drawing what I had in my head mental and it looked right. Mm. The only thing, there's just a few little references. Like when you're at a dumpster, I always like to climb in them, (laughs) which means that there's stairs, there's rungs. And then to get on that first rung, you got to put your, so that tells me the scale. So I don't need to see a picture of a guy doing that. I just imagine going to look inside of one mm-hmm. and then, oh, okay. So if I had to go like that and you can't look into a dumpster from standing, you got to get up on the rungs to look over. So it's over my head. So they're this tall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, there's a couple uh weirdos pieces that you had that I've, I thought were very enduring, like uh they were in two different issues, but they were kind of the same theme. Uh, in issue 20, 21 took place in 1958 in year seven. And Auntie Mary smacks smacks you with, and your scrawny body coming out in a, a, of a wetsuit. And then in Weirdo 24, you're 37. And she points out the scrawny body again. You wrote like some things never change. Um, it was like little those little moments in time, kind of sentimental moments that are endearing that you're able to put out there um uh, you know when when those moments happen do you then think i want to put that down on paper or is it more like you think of it later and then decide to express it i don't i don't live life for content Mm -hmm. you know i'm what i did last time or what i did when i started out is changed so much i've been at this 40 years you know Mm -hmm. so when i think back on auntie mary that's just ancient ago and why i did it the first time was because it seemed like i needed to correct an injustice and then the set and then a miracle or a strange turn of events i was back at her pool i never thought i would be back at my aunt's pool And yet there we were. And she did the same exact thing. So shocking to me that she learned or nothing changed. Nothing changed her behavior in all those years of of that. So when I think about now, like what I'm doing now, I have no ax to grind. I have no agenda. But I have something I'm trying to say. Right. And it is based on what has happened or what I've experienced. But yet I'm sick and tired of talking about me. I'm sick. I'm sick of being the central character. And I want to pass the football. You know, I want to get out of it. And that's Mm. part of what I wrestle with. And part of what I communicate in my next work is is getting away from the self as subject matter. Right. I want to be the star of the show i just want to tell the stories that i happen to be in (laughs) because i mean then it's like well then why don't you make up characters and it's like i don't want to do that because i've already figured out how to draw my head and my hair and stuff Mm -hmm. it's easy it's kind of like a way in and i don't think i make them about me i think they're just about i hope they're just about life or people connect something about there you go yeah the connections they, with people, yeah. Yeah. And I've, I'm always, I've been really trying to backpedal out and get more into other stories. But I'm also very concerned. Um, it's hard to love other people's families. Mm-hmm. You know, oh, my great aunt so-and-so. And the minute people start talking, you go. <laughs> <laughs> you lose interest, huh? Yeah. I don't your aunt or your grandmother or something like that. I mean, but I, if they I, were born with like a very large birth defect, that's more interesting, right? That's terrible. Um, no, it's just, how do you get it away from being like your precious, uh, only, you know, some people, some people who, uh, you know, it can't be just, you're doing this because of a family treasure component. There has to be something to it. And I can't make it be about, oh, this is me and my family. It has to be about, do you get this about humanity? Right. Have you had this feeling? The human exchange, yeah. 
Um, so there was one Weirdo 22 uh, took place in 1967. I think you're 16 at this point. And grandma had a stroke trying to elope. Is that right? Did that really happen? That wasn't mine. That wasn't yours. Return of Mrs. Kite. No. Did I read that wrong? Oh, yeah. yeah oh, no, that, yes, 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 yes. That definitely is. Oh yeah, that was yours, was right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm glad because I'm gonna. I, I was gonna commit myself to a hospital if I got that wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll rescue you. Yes, <laughs> the return of Mrs. Kite. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that was that was uh, my grandma Stella. And okay, that so that that story. happened. Yeah, true story. True story. I think, you know, the other thing is my parents were story. My dad was, my dad and mom were both storytellers. My dad would sit down. I think it's, um, he'd sit around the table and they'd be getting drunker and he'd be saying the next thing, he'd be slamming the table. <laughs> the jokes, you know, they'd be laughing about, oh, Chuck, you're a son of a bitch. Just the way that they uh, would encounter life and then talk about it. And I'd hear that. So I heard that story about him him shoveling her driveway and then she stepped across, you know, I heard that and this shiny sleeves thing. My mom told me that she had the shiny sleeves because she'd use it to rub her nose. Like, oh, that's so gross. But it's just like my mom remembered that funny, odd thing, you know, that grandma had shiny sleeves and just things about them. So it just putting that together. And it was my 16th birthday, you know, she had that stroke and then died. It was like, and I intended for that to be a long saga. I was going to continue that. In fact, I drew the second part of it, it takes it up it, the next day in my high school and all this stuff, but it just, it never, I, I didn't get finished. <laughs> okay. I got you. kids. You know, right. Kid and job. Right. And, uh, you know, we're talking about, Whoa, we're going to do a story for Weirdo. I'm going to get, what, $35 a page. Well, I'm going to work my ass off. I'll end up with $200 at the end of this. That'll just about cover what? <laughs> well, yeah, because that, that kind of goes into the uh, anatomy of a new mom uh, in 1988. And you show varicose veins, unshaved legs, bigger thighs, plugged milk ducts. Everything's painful. Um, just brutally, brutally honest uh adjustment you, to the new state have you, have you do you have this in your family you got kids yeah uh-huh so i wouldn't say that i have it all those things but yeah i mean i know you, there's definitely a change yeah but that's going thing. on yeah there are things going on for sure yeah above and below I remember that this and when i did you know, later i did the outrage of that same time we were still being sold the idea that motherhood was so beautiful and perfect and there was no downsides and, you know, you had to do a natural childbirth and it was going to be wonderful and we were going to be better than our mothers. We're not going to use forceps and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, this was, this was the epic uh, epitome of womanhood and all this. And for me, it was like, this hurts. It was terrible. And I, I had such a long labor and it was, I was also by myself, isolated. I had no help. It was just me and Justin who was gone on sign jobs a lot. So I was an isolated mom and I, it was awful. Mm -hmm. I've talked it over with my kids. She knows. You don't, you don't have a kid with an unavailable mate or solo with no resources without having that take on it. Right. Of course. Yeah. It's a very real, very, uh, it's almost. And there was a no, there was There's no a disappointment. name for postpartum. The postpartum. I had, I had postpartum psychosis. There was no name for that. Right. Yeah, you know what I mean? Defined, yeah. That wasn't a thing. You just had to pull it together. Yeah. So when I drew that, that was like, that's exactly what, the, this is what I went through. Because when I had my baby in the maternity room there, there was a picture of a woman in soft focus and she had her infant and she was laying in, it was perfect. It was like, mother. And, the, and I was like, get that 
thing off of me. Get your hair away. I couldn't stand it. Yeah. I, I didn't want it. Ugh. Yeah, and I, that anatomy I, of a new mom was a very, very focused image. Uh, on, there was no uh, soft focus on any of that. Yes, I had a baby, but look what it did to me. And there, there, there was no talking about that. Nowadays, they do. There's hope for women. I, I did my part. I tried <laughs> to bring people to the awareness that it's no, it's no cakewalk. Right. Now, still talking about weirdo, tell us about Lisa Lee. It was like a secret identity of like uh, critiquing or commenting on submissions and writing. Uh, yeah. Who, who was Lisa Lee? Who was this, this character? Aileen said, Carol, help me. <laughs> I've got so many people sending in stuff and I don't have time to read all this. Could you do this? I said, I'll do it, but I got, I can't do it as myself. I'll do it as a fake character. So I became the, the weirdo offices, which don't exist. The office slut. And I was going to tell these stories, you know, <laughs> I, I was going to review all the stuff, but mostly all I did was talk about the working conditions. <laughs> Yeah, I got gotcha. you. That's the weird. It was all fake. I like the head swagger, as you said, office slut. I've never. That's. Yeah, you have a good way of expressing these ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, Very well I, animated. Then I had this idea. You know, she was going to make money on a. She had a money making scheme to get her out of these this hell which she was in. <laughs> right. <laughs> how to? How to? I don't even remember it, but it was just you know, something. And I, and then I, at the bottom, name a few people. Yeah. <laughs> people who sent work in. So the main thing is I turned it all about Lisa Lee and her complaints. Uh-huh. It just, you know, and then it was easier for me to do because it was like, holy God, I'm supposed to read through all, I couldn't. Right. Like more than Aileen could because I also had stories due. I had a little kid and I'd have to get a story due by her deadline and then Working through all this stuff is like, not just do it that way. Right. That's that's good. Yeah, nobody seemed to care about it. I mean, I, I never heard a word about Lisa Lee. It and this was, a, was this in any, uh, the alliteration, was that in any way linked to Lois Lane at all? Yes. You caught it. Very few people did. Well, okay. it was me. Well, yeah. I mean, Jim, 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 uh, Jim and I discussed this beforehand. Yes. Lois Lane and Lana Lang, right? Lana Lang. So it was about that. So even though you weren't really uh, Superman or you still had these. It was in our household. Here. Yeah, it was in our house. It was in the house. So you knew the name. My, yeah. sister, my sister and brother, when, when we were little, there were always, you remember the 50s, there was always some secret decoding thing going on or you know, there was always um, stuff they were throwing at us in pop culture and you know, one of them was LL. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of LL in pop culture. Mm-hmm. So, so um, now in 1988, you were awarded the inaugural Dory Seda Memorial Award for Best New Female Cartoonist from Last Gasp. So yes. did you feel like, I've made it, I've, I've, be, I've become recognized, this is a validation of what I'm doing. What, how, tell us about that experience. It was gut wrenching. I had a couple, I was in the right place at the right time. I just showed up in San Francisco and I was painfully aware of the fact that people were there for years. And yet I was getting stuff published and, you know, people liked it. People were writing into weirdo saying they liked it. And I felt like, Ooh, did I earn this? You know? Hmm. And then I was in um, some women's stuff and women's had been around a long time. And here I was showing up and then I had a cover and I, I felt, I felt bad about all that because, you know, I'm, I'm from a working class family. You know, you start out as an apprentice and then you're a journeyman and then you're a master. And here I just kind of showed, I just felt terrible. And then there was the um, Dory was, a wild woman, friends with Christine Critter, Critter, and those two were San Francisco with Don Donahue, drinking a lot, partying a lot, and um, uh, uh, the crumbs loved her. 
and she had work in Weirdo. Um, but Trina and Ron Turner came up with the idea for an award. And when she passed away, they thought it, they would put it in her name, which mortified Aileen and Diane, because it was as if, wait a minute, she wasn't rolling with women's, she was ours. You know, it was like this faction thing. I was like, what do you mean faction? There was, a, there was a territory deal. Territory. You knew about that? Well, Did no. I mean, territory? we're getting this from you now. Yes. Yeah, there was this idea that there was women who did comics for pol political reasons and then other people who, as Aileen said, likes to get laid. <laughs> right. Yeah, some people like some people like that. And so there was like this, these two, and here I am nominated for this award. Yeah. And people are saying, don't accept it. You know it's in Dory's name. Other people would say, it's an honor to accept it. It's like, I'm in the middle and I'm like, I don't even know if I belong at this party. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, oh, interesting. In the yeah, there's like politics around this. Yeah, I love Dory. I met her and she was wild. She was okay, you know? Yeah. And then I won. I won. It was at, in the San Diego Comic Con, given to me by Ron Turner. And I was standing there with this huge trophy he put together with her dog on the top. I was just standing there. I, 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 I could not talk. Right. Kind of rocking our I place. Could feel the, I could just feel it. Like, if I accept this, they're not going to like me. If I don't accept it, they're not. And it's like, why is this happening? You know? Yeah. I just said, someday I'll be able to talk about this. But I, I think I was able to get out. You know, I feel terrible that this woman died. I feel honored to accept an award in her name, something like that. There you go. But I, I couldn't, <laughs> I absolutely could not talk. And here I was, a blabbermouth who used to get in front of crowds and tell wild stories and have them laying them out in the aisles. And yet I was at San Diego, blah, 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 couldn't talk. It just, I just cried too much. Yeah. Yeah, you're kind of speechless with all that. Makes sense. There's a quite a few conflicting forces happening at the same time. And I mean, it wasn't just the women's. There was people were people would have fist fights at these underground comics parties. Hmm. <laughs> they were fighting over women. They were fighting over this. They were fighting over that. They get drunk and they fight. There were people punching. Hmm. This one would punch this one. This girl would be with him, and then she'd go be with him, and then he'd be with her. It was a mess. Wow, sounds like. Rock and roll lifestyle, though. Right it was. There. It was the early undergrounds, totally rock and roll. And then I jumped into that. There was more drama, more rock and roll, crazy. But then, of course, I was in the domestic side. I was up in Sacramento with a kid and Justin Sign Painter. So it slowed down quite a bit. But the crumbs <laughs> were my neighbors, so they saved my ass. The crumbs were over here in Winters, and in Dixon there was Bob Armstrong. I didn't get to see him that often. Oh, cool. But. I did go hang out. Aileen and I hung out a lot. Yeah. For a while there. Okay. Winters. That's where the crumbs lived. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's cool. Um, all right. Well, Jim, go ahead on women's comics. Um, you mentioned <clears throat> you mentioned a Diane. I just want to clarify. That's Diane Newman, correct? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, now, so I love just, these. I love them all. I love Diane. I love Aileen. I love Trina. Right. Well, I wanted to get we're, into that we're a little actually bit. Actually, a quick, uh, quick question I have. Were the fights fueled by alcohol or cocaine? The underground stuff was booze and pot. Booze and pot. Okay, there you go. All right. Cocaine does not make you fight. Yeah, okay. There you go. So it's more the booze and the pot mixed. Some comics, some rock and, and jealousy, roll, jealousy, jealousy, sexual bravado. Yeah, you know, uh, I'll show you. Oh, okay, get like that, and then <laughs> with the women, it would be just yeah, smirking and all that stuff. It'd be like, oh, stop! I don't know. Yeah, I want the fights. Right, right. 
that's cool. So I, I wanted to, before we get to women's comics, I want to ask just a few things on, on Weirdo about the end of it. What was what was happening there at the end? Like, it was, I mean, it was such a, a, a great moment in comics. And with Aileen, it was bringing in all of these women artists. It, I mean, it's a, it was yeah. a, a huge moment. Um, yeah. What was the downfall? Was, was it just not getting enough... Um, not not enough readers or what what was closing it or were were there personality clashes or what was what was bringing it to an end i think no i don't think it was personality i think you know you had your east coast west coast thing going for a while there raw magazine and weird over here and by then bijou and arcade and all those things were winding down pretty much gone and then the crumbs moved to france that changed things a little bit um that was just, that was like a kind of an end of an era when they left. Um, head shops closed. A lot of places where you'd go get these things would closed, head closed. And they'd start to go to bookstores. And then there was a big problem because you'd be in the bookstore, <clears throat> you'd ask for the comic section, you'd end up seeing all this super stuff and it'd be very few, if any, things like R. Crumb's Weirdo in a place like Barnes & Noble. So where do you get that stuff, sure. you know, distribution? Uh, it just petered out, you know? Now, you were talking about trying to figure out how to make the the black and white and the, 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 the line work. And you even talked about wind and things. Were... Were you were each of you all the artists there learning from each other or adapting because like everybody had different approaches to it? I mean, with like Mary Fleener bringing in all of you know the cubism and things, and and uh, Julie Doucet doing the stuff she was doing and the fluidity of 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 her stuff. Were you guys learning from each other, or was it just finding it within yourself? You know, I can't speak for others, but I was very, very acutely aware of the fact that I did not want to look like I was taking anybody else's stuff. So I would read people's comics, but at the same time, I had a slight aversion because I didn't want to inadvertently. It takes a lot to trans translate your marks and find what works for you. Can you imagine if I start doing cubism stuff on my pages? Be like, why is oh, she calling yeah. Mary Fleener? You, you couldn't and do it. Once, once she got there, there was no way you could you could do that, even if you wanted well, to. Why would I? Why would I even try? So you find your own mark, your own way of putting it out, and you got to know. There's no, I don't know. Mary li lives in L.A. somewhere, maybe. Uh, Julie was up in Canada. We didn't get together. The only person's work I saw up close was um, Aileen's because she was my neighbor, but I didn't draw like her. And I know she wasn't riffing off of me. She had found her own thing. I guess what I'm saying is, um, when it's not like college where you're all living in the same, or your studios are in the same building or something like that. You work in isolation at wherever you're at. You show up with the work or you send it in or something like that. I do know there was a couple times when I would show up in winters with my pages and it'd be like, oh, I misspelled a word or I forgot something. And I'd have to sit down at Robert's drawing table, pick up one of his pens and make my corrections right there. It didn't seem like I was at the altar of holy or anything. It was just a drawing table handy that I needed in order to get that change corrected because there's no photoshop so i mean getting the white out and fixing the board <laughs> seems like what you sat down in crumbs <laughs> today it's like no no big deal it's just something i had to do in in terms of i mean that's a that's a good point in terms of printing now you were coming from a art background where you had seen your things on display as you intended them to look during the printing process how frustrating was it was in in those early days to do the work and then see what it looked like on paper um, um i had a hard time because 
I'm very aware of like the texture of the paper and you know, if you put on white out and then you put another glob of it on, if you put too much globs of white out, you got a mountain, <laughs> which when printed may show a little ghosting or something like that. So now you're getting shades I didn't intend. So I, I had a lot of, uh, it was a big steep learning curve for me to figure out what I could get away with, what to do and what not to do when it came to um, translating marks and getting things printed. Um, I, I, I look at the work side by side comparison of the originals to the printed today. And I'm like, you know, it's appalling to me because I know what I was doing. I would, I was more interested in the shapes and the textures and you know, that, but it's a flat page people. You know, it took me a long time to say, and now with Photoshop, Hey, it's great. If I misspell a word or I got something wrong, I'll just put it down here in the margin and slip it in later. I don't have to make a patch with an X-Acto knife and tape it from the back and make sure it's clean. And, you know, I, I was appalled because I didn't like the way I was throwing down the marks, the way they were translating. Um, which would look great in 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 oil paint, <laughs> but it's black and white. Yeah, it took me a while. I'm still, like I said, I'm still working on. Sorry, learning things. When to stop? There were. I kept trying to figure out. There's something on me. I kept trying to figure out. Like, okay. My students have trouble with this too. So you got this jaw. There's no line really or the nose, what you have are various shadings. But if you don't shade it with the right size of a crosshatch, it's gonna look like you've got lines on your neck or pieces of lumber, or, or it was all over the place when I started. Um, I go back and I look, it's like, sheesh, you know, clean that up, clean it off. But I was trying to make it um, a color in my mind and it was coming out logs <laughs> yeah, no, we've we've talked to some inkers where they they're they're they want to they're coming from a painting background and and they want to paint and they they have to figure out inking techniques to do that and it's it's very very hard. Really hard. Uh, um so what's the difference between um weirdo and women's comics in 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 your work? Like when you're doing that when you started doing those were the stories different or was it a just a different um a different comic and you're doing your work and it didn't make any difference. No, the only thing I could think of is that there was themes with women's, there was a theme. So it'd be like, the theme is disastrous relationships. It's like, okay, I can tell a story about that. Sure. What story would I do? And I think, well, the first thing you think about is the breakup with so-and-so it's like, I don't want to do that. Push past that a little Tyler. What, what can, can you remember something disastrous that happened to somebody else and that's when I remembered my roommate um who was South Korean right yeah so that was your roommate I yeah. see and so I it's, I mean I could have picked a hundred stories about my own disastrous relationships but I thought let, let's see if we can focus on somebody else yeah, well, that, that, was, that was actually good focus because I, I found myself engaged in that one, wondering what's going to happen next with this yeah, yeah. relationship. That was really well executed. So when, when Women's Comics um, gets a new publisher for issues 11 through 13, and they're, they're uh, doing it through Renegade Press, uh, did, you, did, did you know uh, Denis Lobert? No. Um, so I would you, I'm sorry? I wasn't part of the collective. Uh, so you, like, you were just submitting work and it didn't really matter who was who was publishing it. I think I was on a list. They'd send me a thing and say, hey, you want to contribute? Be like, sure. And I didn't pay attention to the who was who. It's like, oh, here's another gig. Because I was looking, you know, I, I really wanted to make a living at it. And it was hard to because the rates were so bad. And I knew I was learning. And I was new to the party. 
And so I was doing what I could to stay humble and try to understand how I could tell comics and tell a good story and all of that. And, oh, here's another. Okay, I'll do one for them. Or I'll, here's a special one-off that Fanagraphics is doing. Okay, I'll do that. Was there something different about being involved in women's comics because of the history of it, of the, the, it was just another, it was just another job, just like weirdo for you. I hate to say that. I didn't, I didn't know there was a mission, you know, is there a mission? Oh, to be a part of women's means something. No, to be a part of women's meant, wow, I get to have a story published with a bunch of other awesome cartoonists. And is, is this when you met Trina or did you already know her? I think I must have met her through Turner because she and she and Ron were very good friends. And uh, I think he published a lot of her or helped her in her beginnings. Um, but she adored. He adored her and she was wonderful and always kind to me. I just <laughs> Trina was kind to me. Aileen was kind to me. Everybody in that comics community was so welcoming and so kind. I just felt wonderful, you know. I and I don't. I, I also I was very sensitive about not wanting to be perceived as Justin Green's wife. Let's give her a job right. because she's married to Justin, or you know. I didn't want that. I wanted my own merit, and so I made that clear with people, you know that. I don't want you to say what we want you to be in this because you're, we like Justin. I want you to do it because you like my work. Now, Trina has, has often talked about the, the, um, the sexism of the early, um, early underground stuff. Did you, did you encounter that or did you, was it not as pronounced by then or, or it just wasn't something you were, you were thinking about? Uh, I'm aware of it now, but at the time, I remember saying to her, I don't get what you're talking about. Oh, I that's interesting. That, you know, whatever I want to publish. Look, we had Aileen there. Check on this. Like, we had Aileen as the um, editor. She was in for the work. So there was that. But I'll tell you, something happened at... Um, one of these shows I was at recently, I can't remember if it was SPX or at Comic-Con, but these, I was on a panel with a bunch of guys. Maybe it was weird. I don't remember, but they were, I was on a panel with a bunch of guys. We were talking about the old days and they were like, ha ha ha. And remember how we used to make a hundred bucks a page. And I said, hundred bucks a page. I was in that issue. I only got paid 35. And they were like, I'm thinking Trina oh. was right. Do you think that was actually at the weirdo panel in San Diego? That that was where they were? No, I don't know. I don't think it was. It, but it was something it was so revealing to me that these guys were all laughing about the low page rate. Maybe it was 75 bucks. And I know I was making 35. So it's like, fuck, they were paying the men more than me. Is that true? You know what a difference that would have made if I had been able to make that same page. It seems like nothing today, but back then you're spending 20 to 30 hours on a page. And I remember saying like, um, oh, Aileen wants a four pager. I wonder if I made it a five page. That's an extra. Well, I think I was getting 50 bucks. Maybe was, that, was that? Was that? And I always, I think page rates should be the same, but, but do you think that was a gender thing or was it more like someone was, um, had more of a reputation and people wanted to see their stuff more at that moment in time? Was there a seniority issue there or was it really a gender difference? I was all of the above because there were times it would make me so damn mad. I would do a really good story and then there'd be, the names of the people contributing on the cover and more and more. That was my name, I guess. And more. 
So how are you ever going to get looked at? How are you ever going to be recognized? How are you going to get up there if you don't get put on the cover, if they don't champion your work, if they don't get behind you, they'll pay you. Because when you're working for shit wages like that, a little bit of money, and you have to go get a second job and a third job, you can't put your full attention to things. If somebody had said to me, I love you so much and I love your work so much, I'm going to throw some money at you. I would have said, thank you. I could buy childcare and I can produce 10 pages. And they'll be like, I, I, can, I can do this. Because guess what happened? The minute my kid got in college, I did soldier's heart. Yeah, and, and I can't wait to get to that because that's that's the thing. I mean, that's something. Um, but super quick, just because people are going to um, want to know, um, tell us tell us who your your babysitter was uh, back back in the early days. Leonardo DiCaprio, Leo. Yep, and that's because his father his his father was was a comic book guy, and 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 um, uh, knew Justin. They had done some work together, and he was around, and he was good with kids, yeah. right? George, George, and I think Justin did some illustrations for him. Oh, uh, I couldn't get a sitter, so I had to bring the kid with me, and I was like, oh, I have to bring the kid to the party. <laughs> and they were like, don't worry about it. We've got child care. And it was Ron's son, Colin, and his friend, Leo. And they, um, well, she was like, mom, yeah. <laughs> yeah uh, okay. Yeah. So I moved and be with people. And then I went, I thought, I'm going to go check on my kid. And so I went in there and looked and they were, <laughs> Leo was tickling her on the bed. <laughs> Cute. How old? Uh, how old was he at that point? Oh God! Okay, he must have been like. How old is this guy? How old is he now? Oh, I don't know. He's no, young. they were a little older. They were like ten years old or something, maybe. Yeah. So this was before was... he was on growing pains. Yeah. Yeah, because he's forty-six. He was and born she in later had his poster up from Titanic. He's My born daughter's 74, 35 so now. he was probably, um, yeah, maybe 11, 14 or 12. 12. Oh, even early before. 12, when was your daughter born exactly? 85. 85. So he's probably 12. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So they were um, like yeah. playing video games and being like goofy guys. But then, you know, they were jumping on the bed. The next time I checked, they were, she was laughing her ass off. So <laughs> that's awesome. Great and and then yeah, we we'll talked about uh, Georgia Caprio when we interviewed uh, Bill Stout. They're they had some involvement together as well. That's pretty cool. And then one other celebrity connection is, and I don't know if it's true or not, is um, is William Friedkin um, a cousin from uh, your your husband? Yeah, first cousin. Do you, do you know Although him? Friedkin does not like to discuss this. He has <laughs> distanced himself from Justin for reasons that we do not understand nor care about anymore. So it's like fine. You want to be like that? Stupid. And um, Let's see what other claim to fame I have. I mean, people say, I know you. They say that about me, my students. It's like, oh, I'm a celeb. Woo, that's so cool. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, he's the biggest thing, I think, Leo. But I wanted so much for him to, when she was going through her bad time, when she was 12, I wanted so much for Leo to show up and cheer her up. But it didn't happen. Although she was able, she got a lot of mileage out of that. She had started at a new school and walked in and they were like, who are you? And she said, it doesn't matter, but Leonardo DiCaprio is my babysitter. <laughs> that that had to get her like right up there. And that she was <laughs> cool. All right. Alex is going to talk about um, Late Bloomer. And the, the the book the stories that go in it. All right. You had worked on women's comics, and you know, in through the '90s, there was uh, Twisted Sisters with Kitchen Sink, and a lot of this stuff was collected in 2005 in Late Bloomer. Fanographics did it. It was a reprint, but there was also some unpublished work. Robert Crumb said in the foreword that, and I'm going to quote him here. It says all about that your stories are all about gritty reality. 
the hard struggles of common everyday life, no escapism, no cutesying. She never tries to make herself come off as Miss Cool and Clever. Nothing is contrived or overdramatized. The level of honesty about herself is shocking at times, you'll see, but it's the kind of revelation that uplifts and instructs. So is that how you see your own work? Is that what you're aiming for when you're doing that? Is there a consciousness to it or is it really an artistic subconscious effort to get energy out creatively? Well, tell us about that process a bit. So what Late Bloomer is, is a collection of pretty much the stuff I did for Weirdo and Women's and some mm. other random one-offs that were out there. And so the reason for doing them is that I just always wanted to tell a story, you know? I wanted it to be a good story, something worth reading. Pretty simple like that. Mm -hmm. And people can read and interpret, but in order to tell a good story, you have to be honest. And so you can't um, shy away from difficult truths or uh, lie to your audience. Uh, that stuff shows through. It seems funky or wrong. Right. It doesn't so, fit. Uh, no, it doesn't fit. So I, my work has, yeah, it does have an authenticity. It's because I, I tell tell you what's going on. I'm going to tell you what that what happened or what that thing was or what I felt or what I encountered. One of my um, favorite ones from there is a 1991 story you did, Adult Children of Plumbers and Pipe Fitters. And it was this plumber's daughter who was like, uh, worked in a corporation and was very talented, but she was very foul mouthed and practical fixing people's pipes in the office. That was, that was funny. And how much of that do you feel like you've, because your dad was a, uh, was a plumber that almost that you're, you come off this way to some people too yourself? No, I, I was actually working in an office in a, a history center. And there was a lady there who kept, who was in a codependency group. Yeah. <laughs> it was like, what's that? You know? And then she would talk about her. She'd have to go hug her little teddy bear in her office and be like, that is so weird. <clears throat> and then she'd talk about codependency, codependency. And that she was an adult child of an alcoholic. It was the thing at the time. And I thought, well, I'm an adult child of a pipe fitter. <laughs> wonder how that would be. And so I just imagined, you know, this lady on her way to a meeting with the big shoulder pads and the whole bit, you know, with the hair and nails and having to go to the meeting and yet notices in the break room, notices a drip. Well, that's, that could cost money, you know, because she knows. Uh, she's, right. That could end what's in, she knows what's involved. Yeah. Yeah. So she starts working, tinkering with it, and then it becomes a full blown problem. And they're like, um, I was thinking about that the other day because the, the office, the main guy's name is Mr. Greedy. You tell Mr. Greedy, I'll be up in a minute. And so she gets involved and fixes the drink. She's cussing like a plumber. Because that's what they do. You got something, son of a bitch. <laughs> and, you know, and here's this. She's a, a lady with a puffy uh, bow right here, ready for her yeah. meeting. Right, right. And so um, he tell Mr. Greedy, I'm saving him thousands of dollars on plumbing bills. Yeah, it's a, big, it's a big deal, yeah. And then uh, she's in her codependency meeting later with her teddy bear, and she's talking about how he doesn't appreciate what she, you know, what she did for him, basically. So right. it was straight out of what this lady was talking about all the time about her codependency group, and I thought, Okay. Adult children of alcoholic. Well, I'm an adult child of a plumber and this is how it would go down. <laughs> okay. There you go. Yeah. So then um, now 93, you had a story, migrant mother. Um, oh. And uh, this was interesting because you, you lived in Sacramento in 1986. Right. And this is all about being a new mom again, mm -hmm. traveling to Colorado. It was hell. Something about permanent damage to the right ear. No. Uh, uh, you know, so that that sounds that that sounds like a tough. That all happened. It all happened. I went out there. My husband had a, one of these miraculous gigs where he made twenty five thousand dollars in six weeks. It was fluke. So we were like in the money. Mm -hmm. He was ecstatic. 
And I got a cold when I was there. You know, I started to feel bad, shitty, really sick. And it, it goes through that in the story. It talks about how I feel so terrible, but I just I just get this thought in my head because my kid was terrible twos at the time. Right. I'm just gonna go home. I could make you know, because my home, I fixed the house is basically a giant rubber room. She couldn't hit her head on a coffee table because we didn't have one. It's just a piece of carpeting and pillows. There's nothing uh, very simple. So uh, just go home. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get home because I had terrible ear. They stop in Phoenix, then they were going to go home. I couldn't make it out of Phoenix. I terrible. Uh, it felt like there. It felt like honestly, it felt like up in there. You know, putting things up. It, like it was like chopsticks they were sticking up in right, right head. into that right into that frontal sinus yeah oh it was the most painful if don't ever get on a plate with a cold because as they descended i couldn't relieve the pressure and it was pushing and i was trapped i thought i was gonna have a stroke i thought i was gonna explode and i had a terrible kid it, everything wrong. I'd sent the baggage ahead i had no cash on me you know it wouldn't happen today but back then it was an absolute disaster, and she was a hell on wheels in the airport. <sighs> <laughs> this sounds hard. I feel like I did that to my mom. I'm sure. Um, I feel like I feel like maybe every I put my mom through something it. like that. Yeah, every kid acts terrible at at that age, but to be sick and stranded, it's just awful. <laughs> People like that story. Um, I've heard over the years about they can relate to that, especially when they have their terrible kids, you know, yeah. terrible kids. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel like I did stuff. I think one time uh, my mom took me to Marshall's and then I actually went and hid in one of those clothes carousels for like five hours. And she was, she thought I was kidnapped. She had the cops come. Oh, and then I just stayed doing? there. I oh, stood I there and I tortured her and I knew what I was doing. I think I was five at the time. But she and, and she still brings it up now. And I finally got out. Ta-da. And she was like, that's not funny. I mean, it was yeah. I feel bad look, look I think bad. it's funny, mom. Come yeah. on. <laughs> and I feel like, yeah, you you were kind of tortured in a similar circumstance. In 1995, and you talked, you mentioned about the Hannah story about the your late sister Anne that you found out more about. 1969, you were 18, and then you and that's when you found out about Anne, right? When you were 18. I think I was 17. You know why? Because I'm a late in the year birthday. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Doesn't matter. I know what you no, mean. I'm, I'm about, one of those too. Yeah, you're right. Okay. I didn't hear about Anne until I was in my 1993, two or three. So what is that? 40s? Okay. So although you found out about Anne at 18, you got the details later. I Well, I knew my whole life. I knew about Anne. Okay. Like I said, she was the star at night. And she was also, we, I knew we had her because I saw I her pictures. So even as a kid, your mom would make a reference to her. Very simply that she was in the photographs and not to think about it. Just mm -hmm. And um, every now and then she'd just start crying about something I had to do with Anne. And then it would be it. And then that was it. So, and, th and that was done in Drawn in Quarterly 1 in 1994. You were nominated for a 1995 Eisner Award, and it's on the Fantagraphics list of top 100 comics of the 20th century. So this struck a chord with a lot of readers, including myself, when I first read it. I, I don't, I've never had that happen to me, but I can easily see that happening to any parent or any family. What do you think it is about that story, that, about your story with that, that connects so many people when, when they all read that? I don't know, because <clears throat> I started to realize that I was connecting at a certain point. And yet I didn't want to feel like, oh, this is my job to connect with these emotionally gripping stories, because I only have one sister that died. Mm -hmm. And I thought um, I was so happy that I was time tripping with it, you know, showing old, an older ear or I could do before like looking back at a go and today and translating visually, I was 
looking at the formal aspects of conveying the idea, but I don't really, um, when I did Hannah, I'd worked at that history place for five years and I got laid off and then I banged it out in like a few months. So it was pent up. Yeah. I've been doing weirdo stories and I had to stop or cut back a lot because I was working at this history place. And then that's during that time is when my mom told me. And so the first chance I got, that's the story I did. I remember Chris Olivero saying afterwards, you think you could do another one like that for our, for our next issue? It was like, no. Right. We need more of that. <laughs> yeah. I can't. And then I wanted to, um, I, you can't overanalyze things or you'll kill it. What? You okay? Oh, there was something about also you made mention of abduction of 12 year old poly class. Is that yes. right? And yeah, that because had during, some during the whole connection. time in California, this was one of the most gut wrenching abduction of a chill of a child. Um, it was live television. So uh, back, back before the media, the way it is today, you can get on your thing and look up anything at any time. So you're sitting there watching TV, you know, and you see the Challenger explode. You're watching TV. All of a sudden there's live coverage from Santa Rosa about this girl who was stolen out of her bedroom. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. Right. So, uh, or the kid gets stuck in the drain pipe. So you see, it was the whole experience. There was a, an experience that we really don't have today. In that, it, it comes upon you like that. What? Oh, this is shocking. And so the whole time I was doing that, yeah, the poly class drama was unfolding. And then they uh, had her funeral live. Oh, it, was, it was so sad. Got to. Me. So I put that emotion into peace. Into in Hannah, mind. right? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't because of that, but it was that's where I was at. When yeah. I was doing I knew I was like, okay, now you know, with anything that you're doing that's emotional, you have to hit the content. But when I did that Hannah story, <clears throat> I had also done all this research into like, wait a minute, Ravenswood Hospital. Are they still in business? Mm. And okay, so you it, looked into it, the hospital where the old fashioned way died. I had to look things up and make phone calls. And so when I found out that she died because the hospital had fucked up, I called the hospital to find, to get her records. And the one lady says, Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. We got them right here. I said, Oh great. Okay. Cause I want them. Yeah. Send them to me here. Well, okay, and then call call back tomorrow. Fine, I will. I call back, and I get this. They, we, we're going to transfer you to this other lady. So I get this other lady. She says, oh, hi. So you're the sister of a long-deceased Ann Tyler. Oh, I understand that you you have a desire to contribute to a fund to have a memorial fountain built in her. I said, what? No. She honestly thought I was calling. Ravenswood Hospital, this lady, to donate money so they could build a memorial fountain to her. I said, where did you get that idea? I want her, I want my sister's records. I want to know exactly, according to you guys, what happened. I know what happened. <clears throat> well, I kept not hearing, not hearing, and hearing. A couple of weeks later, I called back and they said, oh, there's no records. Yeah. They conveniently And that lost. happened around the time you were putting that story together? That happened in the 90s, this this situation with the records? So when I, because my mom didn't want anything to do with it. I was like, mom, you can still sue. She was like, leave it alone. So when I um, was drawing the Hannah story, and there's that place where she's got the burns. I draw a line and there's like smeared. The red ink is smeared. That's because I was crying while I was drawing it. And I was having, taking a tissue and dabbing because I didn't want to get it on the page, but it hit the red line and made all those smear marks that were her burns. Hmm. Oh, wow. So then 
the mechanism of death, just so from what I read, was that she had burned herself. I think your uh, mom was preparing something on the oven. It poured on her, burned her. She went to the hospital, stayed in overnight. Oh, and wait, stop. They... Stop. Okay. There's no ambulance. There's no 911. Right. So you're screaming out the window while you're hanging your kid. Help! Right. Help! Is, yes. Some neighbor drives her to the place. They say, she'll be fine. We bandaged her up. Yes. Go home. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Because there's no phone. My mom and dad didn't have a phone yet. Right, right. So when they came in the next morning with their bouquet to pick up their child, a clerk at the front desk says, oh, she's listed as deceased. Right. So they, they she slept on her back, vomited and choked. They gave her on, some right? kind of medicine. Yeah. They gave her medicine. It made her choke. And because they had her on her back, she aspirated. Okay. There you go. That's, I mean, today you would sue the hell out of somebody like that. But my mom said, and I said it in the strip, and she's always maintained that that would have been no good money. It never would have brought us to any kind of goodness or happiness. Hmm. She's right. Right. Revenge money in a way. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to put, yeah, money and justice, how that, that's a complicated, complex question. And there's people that would say, take the money. She said, she did not, she, until the day she died, she didn't want to discuss it. Anything. Right. She thought it was her fault. So then, um, yeah, that's interesting. Because now the next topic is 004, 1995, about licking a dog's butt. That's quite a different topic than what we were just talking about but you did create more things you did go over more stories um one was uh really interesting the uh, it was part of that is i like i would every now and then and say it's comics why don't you make something kind of funny there you go and that's what that is it's a departure from the serious um the night i rode the hard drive to heartbreak 1996 the uh, computer matching uh and a terrible night at the dance. This was printed in Mind Riot, Coming of Age in Comics. Um, so that's interesting. So this was in your high school that they had a computer match with your yeah, with, and and this was what in the in the late sixties they were doing that. Yeah, um, that was a theme comic. It, ha it had to be about new technology and stuff. They, okay. That was the theme. So I thought about that computer dance, and we'd have these cards. I was looking for some. We'd have these like IBM cards and we'd have to f fill in the circles of what our ideal mate was like, our okay, ideal. Okay. Yeah. So then we, they matched us with the high school, like the public school kids. That was the mistake. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let the Catholic kids integrate with them. Uh -uh. And so, yeah, the story goes on to talk about how I get Mr. Gorgeous but he's not interested in me. I'm all dialed up working class style with the wrong clothes. <laughs> and I'm not willing to do what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. So I barked at him like a dog. <laughs> That's he a good reaction. A dog, so I caught him in the parking lot. Rah, 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 you're terrible. And you actually did that. Yeah. I do that. My stories are not fiction. That's amazing. I think um, I, I, that's funny. Um, 2002, the substitute teacher at oh. Warzone Elementary um, wanting to survive the parking lot, but it turned into a sad discussion of the mental illness of the young girl, Mara, who killed herself. Um, that was an interesting one because it kind of starts off comical, but then it becomes this like really sad thing. Um, and that's an interesting, almost bittersweet story, right? Um, well, because that's, isn't that the way it is with children? And I'm talking about my experiences as a sub, which anybody who's been a substitute teacher knows you've got a million stories and you have to be adaptable and you have to, you know, make it up on the fly half the time. And I really kind of covered the topics of the situations I would roll into. And then, it, yeah, the, the most shocking was was when this incident with this girl who over the weekend hung herself 
and then to go back to that same school and find out about it. Right. And no one called you. No one told you, hey, well, that person that you sub. have connected with did that. Yeah. I tell the sub, just the sub lady. That was, that was, that was hard. So, um, 2002 and in the end and you work your daughter into the comic and she's older and she understands comics now she's co-author in it so this is an interesting evolution from her being the toddler that was torturing you on a flight and now it's like she's in the comics with you so tell us about that and kind of seeing her grow up and and being a co-author in some of this stuff well in late bloomer i set it up into three sections so the first section, you'll see a picture of her as a little baby on, on the first part of the, the kind of like the first section. Mm -hmm. There's an image of her in the yard and she's on the little blanket I have down. She's cute. <laughs> I've got a few little, her little things on the clothesline. And then the chapter head for the second chapter shows kind of our kid crap backyard and she's like 10 and there's like, you know, things are a little bit more disarray. And I think I show the metaphor for myself on the first one, the chair, I have, a, there's a chair, a drawing table chair, it's in pretty good shape, a little bit worn. And by the third one, there's a tiny little bikini of hers on the clothesline. Those are her clothes as they go along. The baby clothes, there's a bunch of them. When she's 10, there's a few less and then her little bikini and she's in a lawn chair. And my, my drawing table chair is like this. So I show the evolution of her physically for the chapter heads for the content from each of the sections. Yeah. Yeah. So by the time she gets to a certain age, yeah, she's uh, she knows that mommy's going to tell a story about me. Right, mom? <laughs> mommy always talks about me. Yeah. Well, at a certain point when she was, she, she knew kind of early on, I love this story. When she went to kindergarten, she came back home and she said, Mom, guess what? Mommy, Jason's daddy works at a bank. I'd say, okay. And then I thought, wonder what that's about. It's like, oh, because every adult she knows is a cartoonist. Mm. And here she met a kid whose parent is something normal. And she was shocked by it. Yeah. That's right. Culture shock. Yeah. So she was aware of the, you know, that she was in the comics. And over the years, I've explained her and apologized and all this stuff. She said, I don't care. <laughs> well, um, mommy 2005, The Outrage is a fun story. We met, we alluded to that a little bit earlier too, but that was um, 16 pages. Uh, it was about the love of the early 80s who went off and got rich. And then you got married to Judd, who I think is Justin. Yeah. From just the name switch a little bit. Right. And then, and then there was this thought of Roy just kind of getting rich. Um, and this is interesting because a lot, of, and this kind of goes to what Robert Crumb was saying about you is that, you don't put yourself out as the perfect winner or the perfect victor. You put out like things that even the things that you might be um, have some weird feelings about, or even slight that a lot of people would be embarrassed about, but you put it all out there. You, there's no filter. And that's the comic where I do talk about how I get overwhelmed with rage over yeah, he took my energies, a lot of stuff we worked on together. Maybe it wasn't specifically exactly lifted from my sketchbook, but it was certainly lifted from the time where we evolved together. Mm -hmm. And um, it just struck me when I was like at my lowest. And it seemed like, oh, he wins the art game and I'm the loser and I've got this baby. And, and I had lost my milk that week. And I had what they, you know, you get postpartum depression, but you get postpartum psychosis. You can get that after you've stopped nursing. I didn't realize that nursing can defer postpartum depression. Right. And I yeah, was, it, it kind of holds on to some of the pregnancy hormone doing that. Yeah. Yeah. So I crashed. I was having a crash when I saw that show. And that's when I, 
thought I'd stab her to death. <laughs> whole thing, wouldn't it? You know, it was wrong. It was, my brain was wrong. My brain was off. I had to get help. But right. they, they didn't know what that was back then. Now they know it. You know, they can, if there are women who are having this problem, they can or even have a tendency of that. But there was not even a tendency. I remember going to the emergency room. They sent me to a psychologist and I was, it was shameful and embarrassing. That's stupid. No, but I, that's interesting that you, and that you expressed it and, and published it. And and so many women have come up to me and said, I'm so glad you did that. I'm so glad you've revealed pregnancy and motherhood to be exactly what it can be for some of us. Right, right. And it's not just the narrative. It's not just that you told a story. It seems to me that your your storytelling really takes a leap up in this and maybe it's because you had enough space to do it but those images are really really powerful not to say that others weren't but the but the the transformation of you of your body as you're as you're losing it and becoming demonic is i think the most powerful work you had done up to that point now, now of course you get to and we're going to do it next uh segue to you'll never know but but those 12 pages just kick ass in terms of, of conveying just how desperate and how, uh, how dangerous the situation was. Well, I'll tell you, um, that was a full color. Yeah. Everything, everything about it, the lines. I really worked on, uh, I'm talking about formalism now, but I really wanted every single stroke to have, to carry and convey mood through color. And it was, I was able to do that. So I was really happy to do that. But yeah, hey, um, knowing I could do that meant that, yes, I could go to the rage. I could do rage. I could, sh I could use the color to enhance that. And then I was getting skilled to the point where I knew how to paint. I could pace it this way. I could do this. I could show this. I could add this, you know. Um, because you couldn't was, have told that story the same way without the color. It wouldn't have, it, oh, it would have been something entirely different. No. So the doors were opening to color. And I did that just after that at the same, I mean, right. It was like that. And then boom, got right into, you'll never know, which turned into soldier's heart. So they, that was like, my kid was in college. I knocked that out. I got that. Like she graduated in 2003 and left home. No, she graduated high school in 2003 and left home. Moved out. I got that flipped around and it was published in 2005, right? Late Bloomer? Yeah, 2005. And then when it came out, I went to the college up here because I had been subbing and I threw it on the desk of the dean of the art college and I said, I need to be teaching this. It doesn't get any better than this. I can do this. I just bullshitted my way. <laughs> I went into a job because <laughs> I was sick and tired. I'd been, I'd been working. I worked at a, I did a festival in this town. It's like, these fuckers don't, I'm sitting in this meeting. They're talking about where are we going to place the trash? Two hours on where are we going to place the trash can? for the festival. Well, I can draw a trash can better than anybody here. I'm, I don't want to do any more meetings. I want to, if I'm going to do any work, it's going to be teaching this stuff. So I bullshitted my way into teaching a class that lasted for 16 years. That's great. And that was, that was, I know it was on comics, but in, in what, like, what were you actually doing in it? I mean, what was it? Was it in primarily class? a how? To, yes, was it a how to? Was it was it was it primarily? Um, it wasn't like comics history. It was was it a, a learning to do comics, hands on was, kind of class? I I developed a actually I did the teacher thing. I developed a, a mission, a, a rubric, a right standards, the whole thing. I taught them how to do it. I taught them the history of comics. And how to assess comics, how to be, uh, how to to make critical assessments based on content and form. And I never used McLeod's book, 
Sometimes I had kids saying, are we going to have a textbook? I said, I'm your textbook. Listen. Now, was that because you don't agree with McLeod's book or is it just because you didn't think a, a textbook was appropriate, uh, would, would get in the way of the education? I didn't want, yeah, I didn't want it to be, hi, I'm a consumer. I demand a textbook. Show me how we do this. And here's, then I'll feel like I have the outcome that I paid for. It's like, no textbooks. Listen, I'm, I'm uh, very well craft. I have a very, uh, I'm on top of my craft. You want to learn how to do comics? Listen to what I have to tell you and watch what I show you, right? Don't be going to some book that's going to say, here's how you do sequence. Here's it. I'll show you. We'll read it. I had them, I gave them, they each had to do, they each had to investigate like two or three artists work. So I'd say, you're going to do Charles Burns and you're going to do Debbie Drescher, for example. Oh, great. And they'd have to go find the work, buy the books, buy their books if they, if they could. I had a list of people. Like the most represso kid in the class, I'd give him S. Clay Wilson. <laughs> Go find some of S. Clay Wilson's work and read it. <clears throat> and then they'd have to read the work and do a report based on the assessment tool that I had drafted, which means they would have to look at the visual characteristics. They'd have to do, um, you know, uh, tactical assessment and then content assessment based on things like how well does the character convey the mood? Blah, blah, blah. So oh, this is it's fascinating. And I, I wish we could, because I was, I was a teacher too for 15 years. And I would love to talk about this and, and get into rubrics and everything else. Uh, yeah. But we, we don't, we, we want to give you'll never know a fair right. amount of uh, yeah, attention. So let's, let's talk about that in, in like, Tell me when you realized this was going to be the big down. project that it was. Um, I didn't quite know. I just know that dad had called up and said, you know, he was concerned about not, or he was remembering things about the war. I remember um, that that was interesting to me because I didn't have a good communication with my dad for years. And and all of a sudden he was talking to me and I was amazed that we could talk, you know, and so it gave us a place to connect, you know, like, what, 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 Chuck, hey, Chuck, you know, I got to talk to him. I was no longer the pipsqueak. I could say, dad, um, I could call him on the phone. I had a reason to talk to him and a reason to call. And so I thought, um, I'll before I decided to do the thing, I thought I'd just videotape his story. And when I went over there to Indiana where they lived and sat him down and he did that thing where he was going, turn it off, turn it off. He didn't want to talk about the war. I thought, oh boy, why not? Why not talk about it, Chuck? Mm. Mm. You get this look. So I thought, oh, that's interesting. I'm going to, do some research. So I got my big heavy books out and I went to the library and I did, I thought, holy God, based on what he told me, his records and the photographs, I started to realize this guy was in trouble. And which, and then it started to click and explain things. So it's like, I want to write about this. I want to draw this. And the first thing I drew was the pages that talked about, he was getting ready to go into chemotherapy and uh, there was all his chemicals. I thought this will be fun to draw. I did. I really didn't know where I was going with the book. You know, I didn't have an overview type thing. I just knew parts of it. He had trouble talking about it, but he was in France and he was here and he talked about this. My mom did this. And at the same time, this was going on. So I thought, okay, I'm going to try to pull all these elements together, give you a sense of the now, the then, and tell the story through those modes. So the first fun thing to draw, which came right out of that story, we were just talking about the outrage, using color to really convey was that pile of chemicals. And I used a putrid greenish yellow to show the stink marks coming off of the, the fumes and <laughs> stuff. And then that 
because that was talking about chemo. So why was why was I talking about chemo? Because he had resilience. So that was a quality I wanted to talk about. And how does a person who can stand down chemo, stand down cancer the way that he did, why can't he stand down this? I guess he has. I guess he has stood down whatever demons are bothering him. So let me explain who this guy is to the reader. So I, I felt like I had to... People had to know him a little bit in order to feel what he felt, feel his anguish, to feel how I felt, you know, kind of trying to facilitate that, but couldn't because my life was a wreck. So you got somebody who's interested in trying to help out as if I was capable. Now, at this point, um, who was you would you would made arrangements for this to be, I mean, you, you knew this was a project and did you have a editor that was looking at your work as you were going along? Nope. When did, did that happen? At, at, at some point you made a, a, you made arrangements for this to be published. Well, I'd always published with Fanographics. I worked with Kim Thompson over there. And so he was just like, yeah, do whatever you want. <laughs> oh, just, I had a handshake deal, you know, hey, want to do this? Okay, let's shake hands. We'll do this. Did the whole thing here in this very spot where I'm at now, sent all the files by email or Dropbox or whatever it is over the internet. So you sent you sent the, the first volume to Kim Thompson and said, here it is. What was his reaction? Because it's it's like... I mean, it's, I talked about the last thing being groundbreaking, but this is, this is beautiful in a way. I mean, this is artistic in a way that is wholly unexpected. And one of the, I think, more important autobiographical things that, you know, right up there with, with, um, you know, the, the big ones, uh, this is one of those. And what was the reaction by Thompson? I mean, he was excited. He was thrilled. Um, he was, he had asked me years and years ago to up my game a little bit. Don't do the body stuff. He said, you, you pull off the feeling stuff so much better. It's like, I knew that. Um, I just needed that nudge, but he pretty much just let me do what I'm going to do. You know, he had faith in me and um, it just oh. wasn't, you know, he didn't say like, I think on page 57, it's not clear. He didn't say any of that stuff. That was all my doing. Now, was there, was it your decision to do it in three volumes? Yeah, and I did that because uh, my parents at the time, well, they were getting older and older, and I honestly didn't know if they were going to make it. And so I thought, oh, God, this is taking me, it took me so much longer. I kept thinking of little places where I needed to add more content, and the book, as I was doing it, was make, taking shape. Um, I love that title, You'll Never Know. But when it became, when we got all done with the three, Gary was like, and Kim was gone by then. Gary was like, nope, people don't get it. And I said, what do you mean they don't get it? It's their theme song. It's the things you don't know. It's everything. I tied the whole thing in with this title. And he said, nope. And so um, nobody ever meddled with me about anything except that Gary didn't want the title you'll never know he said it was the publicist or somebody or no i don't know uh nor i don't know somebody didn't like it up the food chain and so it had to be changed which i've hated but it's fine soldier's heart is what it is i did it in three sections because of my elderly parents and also because it was taking me so long i needed the buoyancy i needed that propelling of like okay i got one <laughs> Now I'm going to go on to the second one. And then this leads to the third. You know, it just, it, it was, it was gaining traction. Like um, when that New York times, the first, when the first volume came out, the New York times gave it a rave review. It was like, Oh God, now I got to live up to that. <laughs> Jesus. But I, you know, I kept thinking I got to do that. I also felt like I had, done my career up until that point in fits and starts due to my parenting duties and other responsibilities 
I never had the time to devote to just sitting down and doing my work. Um, so I had this job at the college and I could do it, you know, I could fit it in and kind of get it done and take care of them. I'd take the pages up there to take care of them. And um, it just sort of tumbled out that way. And then I put the four, when I put it together as the soldier's heart, I added 60 more pages. So it turned it, it turned out to be a quite a big thing. How did, what, what kind of reaction did you, I mean, could you have surviving family, your brother, uh, brother's, um, what was your family's reaction, various people that saw it during the, the production of it? Or did, or did anybody see it until it My was... dad loved it. He saw it and he loved it. My mom saw the first two. Right. I know she didn't get she to see the it. end. She didn't get to see the end. My dad saw, he didn't get to see the Soldier's Heart big thick book, but he saw the three. Uh, my sister saw, lived through the two. My brothers don't like my dad, so they don't, I don't, you know, it doesn't matter what they think. <laughs> they just, it's a doorstop to them. Uh, and your husband, because he's a he's a uh, he's a player in it too. Was he was he? Um, and he, he's not a, always a sympathetic figure in this. Was he, uh, <laughs> to say the least? Uh, was he? Did he think it was it was fair? Yes, he did. And he said, I, he, he thought I, I think I was fair to him. I think I did it. I did it pretty well. And I've also had to smack some people around. It's like, come on, it's a story. You know, I mean, I'm going to tell it as close as I can. But for the sake of reading readability, it's not like you're reading through like every single date has to follow. You have, there's some, ply, you have to be pliable. You have to have some flexibility in things here and there. So even though, it's like true and it all happened. You you do have to bend it around. It has to shape into a story. It wouldn't read right if you did it just like, and then this happened, and then this happened. And then after that, exactly at this time, this happened. That's not the craft of the art. The art itself has to live. Have, have you talked to uh, surviving veterans of the war? Yes. Yes, I had tell us country. about that because that that I wish my dad had gotten to see this. He died before this came out. Um, so many people have told me how much this book means to them because either a relative or they did like you, you just expressed. I've gone give talks at places and people come up to me afterwards and crying. Um, I wish it had been out twenty years earlier or ten years earlier than it did or it had a bigger impact, um, reached more people. That's okay. I don't think my work's on a timeline like that. But um, I decided to have my class, my students, have the experience of interviewing veterans and then do, read, interpreting their material. That was the lesson. And to listen, interpret, and then create a story based on what you heard. So I would bring them into my classroom. I'd bring the veterans into the class. That was one of the high points of teaching is recruiting the vets, getting them into the class, having the students do this work, and then presenting them with the original artwork afterwards. It was just so great, so great. And these guys appreciated me and women. They were so appreciative of what I had done. The American Legion came and did a video of me and everything like that. And I, what I hate about all of this is that it's a story about resilience, but it's also about post-traumatic stress and it's about the effect of war. So it's not glory, glory to the hero, you know, war heroes. It's about, again, difficult truths and what we live with, you know, when faced in certain situations, how my dad got through it, how it affected me. And so now that patriotism and being an American and all that stuff has been hijacked by these patriots, they don't like it because you showed a soldier who was weak. I've had somebody say that. Oh. No soldiers are weak like that. And then they're, you know, you know, we come to find out 
with the numbers being the way they are with veteran suicides? No. War can, it messes with the psyche. I'm glad I wrote the book, but it just kills me the way that it's, um, people have a perception of the military. A lot of people won't read it because they think it's about, a, it's just a soldier book. It's about, you know, Oh, I'm not interested in the military. Therefore, I'm not going to read Soldier's Heart. <laughs> but you became much more in demand after this in terms of uh, being brought into classes. I remember, I think you came to USC when I was teaching from there. Uh, and I was super aware of your book in, mm -hmm. in that context as well. Um, it just changed who you are as a as an artist wouldn't you say i mean as as both in terms of perception and in terms of your ambition and what you were doing well there was a little bit of a thing you know she's a weirdo artist so she was in women's you know she's a lightweight she doesn't finish any uh, somebody said she doesn't finish anything in fact there was a very cutting comment i was at this talk in chicago and it was centered around some artists some key artists of culture. Think about Gary Panter, The Crumbs, uh, Spiegelman, Francoise, um, Joe Sacco, Linda Berry, Charles Burns, Chris Ware. Okay. When somebody saw me sitting there said, what's she doing here? Referring to me. Yeah. And this, so this was 2012 and I thought, oh, you, you think I'm here because of my husband? Have you not read my latest work? You know, I, when I heard that, I was just like, why does this shit exist? It bothered me. But yes. No one Once can so say that after Soldier's Heart. Huh? No one can no one should have said that in the first place. No. Uh and, but they Which, but but now they can't say it, right? I mean, it has never, the perception has changed. Thank, thankfully, yes, it's not said. And I think um, I'm not and more anymore. <laughs> I'm, I'm and more on Twitter. <laughs> no, I'm not. Um, yeah. I mean, I told my daughter I would never, ever, ever sacrifice one day of being with you that you needed me or being with you as your mom so that I could have a bigger career as a cartoonist. So the fact that, you know, I raised a child, she's off and running and doing well. And she had a lot of psychological problems from OCD and stuff like that. Probably at the time when I could have hit it on a second hard, like around the time of um, 1997, 98 in there, I had to back up because she needed my help. But I don't care on what kind of timeline am I on. I just have to tell the great story. Uh, there is a creep thing going on now. It's, uh, I'm getting old. Uh, uh, and I've got a big story I'm doing now. And it's like I must finish. But it's, uh, it's so exciting for me to do this work, the one I'm working on now. And we're going we're gonna to get to that um, after we talk about the reaction to this after the 2015 publication, what, what happens the following year in terms of all the recognition and things. I, I do want to ask about one thing, and this yes. is because, because I'm a Southerner uh, and therefore have a great weird love of tomatoes. I want to talk about your, your Cincinnati magazine. I, I mean, I love tomatoes. Talk to me about your your one page strip that you you would do for Cincinnati Magazine. Oh yeah, this was in twenty thirteen. Yeah. Um, they called me up and said, "Hey, could you do the inside back cover?" I was like, "Yes, I'm on for that." So, how about call it tomatoes? Because one of the things I did, there were riots in this town in two thousand one, racial uh, cop killing, terrible thing, and. Um, I should call it civil unrest because we got a lot of police reform after that incident. But of course, what happens in, in situations like that often happens is that a bunch of people packed up and moved out to the suburbs. And I thought, nope, I'm going to move into a neighborhood that's, that's, um, uh, has a variety of people 
because I need to know, uh, I think we need to know each other. I'd gone through diversity training through the Underground Railroad Freedom Center. And I was considered to be a modern day freedom conductor. And my task I felt was to live in a neighborhood where I could get to know African-Americans uh, in a way that wasn't stupid, pressurized or artificial. So why not just grow food? I started a community garden and that's how I got to know people. I turned my front yard into like a place where people could come. And the currency was tomatoes. Yeah. So that meant that I could give this guy a tomato that I grew in the garden. And then, you know, next time I'd see him, he's in the back of a squad car, but we could talk about how delicious that was, that tomato that time. So it was like, it was almost like tomatoes were the, the currency and they smoothed things out and we got talking and we got to know each other. The kids were calling me the plant lady. It brought so many adventures. And I have loved living in this neighborhood and getting to know people just through stupid thing like tomatoes, <laughs> you know, a simple thing like that. I don't want to say stupid. So when this guy said, do you want to do a strip? I said, yeah, I want to talk about living in this, in my neighborhood. So the strips every week give a little slice of life about a variety of things, generally around growing, but generally around being and having very casual, but Really, it was really, really been a sweet look at this life in a neighborhood. Yeah, whether it was corn or tomatoes or whatever you you had growing in your garden, you would take it and you would just sometimes just put it on the neighbor's front porch. Or mm -hmm. I remember when I would go back to Duke to visit because I was teaching from LA, but uh, for Duke, I would go back and a professor's wife would come in with eggs that and just say, "Here's here's." Here's a dozen eggs and hand them to you. And that's a, a form of, of communication and goodwill and community um, that's that's a lot of people wouldn't understand. So I, I just think that's great that you conveyed that. Um, yeah, I just wanted to show normalcy because it's always like, you know, African-Americans are depicted in such and such a way. Well, I don't see that here. You know, I just see a guy walking down the street or this one's sometimes, yeah, this guy over here, he's hollering out the window. Or this one over here is doing this and that. But these are not them and that. These are people. These are my neighbors. That is Mr. Keels. That is Jack. This is Gladys. That's Gloria. This is Iris. So these are real people. And they, they've lived beautiful, full lives that have had difficulty. And so I'm just going to talk about what we all have in common. And and I, I just want to say that we we because we're trying to get <clears throat> cover everything, um, but I do want to acknowledge that you had some rough years during this uh, process of of doing the um, the you'll never know, um, in that you lost your mom, you lost your sister, you lost your friend um, Rose, was it? Yeah, my neighbor down the street that's in tomatoes. I call her Iris in the strip, but Rose, yeah. Um, that you had to put your dog to sleep. You were robbed, your house was robbed twice. You got a, a weird disease in Europe. I mean, just, and, and how, you know, while you're doing the, the, the work of your life, the best work of your life, you're also having to persevere through all of this that could crush you. And I, um, crush somebody. And I, I just wanted to acknowledge that. And then you get to 2016 and, everything's being acknowledged uh, with uh, the success of your, your book. Um, uh, and Alex, you're going to take us through that, that particular year. Yeah, there's um, uh, quite a few celebrations uh, that year. So I think five, um, maybe, maybe more, uh, but you had a gallery show at the university of uh, Cincinnati. Yes. Um, this exhibition and from what they're quoting, uh, this exhibition serves as the purging of the past with fragments of past projects, objects from her past and her father's workshop. In addition, we present a collection of artifacts from her life and studio practice, which provides a look into the mind and spirit that molds her vision of the world. So what, it, what and you were the cover story in the Cincinnati city beat there, but can you explain what that, what that means, what they were commenting on and what they were showing of your stuff? Well, first of all, I showed every single page of the book. 
and I had it hanging on clotheslines in the gallery. And so when I met with the gallery guy, he said, I said, so I'm not going to frame this. No way. Let's just hang it up on clothesline. I like that. I've done that before in a couple of little shows before, previous to this where I've hung my stuff with pins. And then he said, okay, so what are you going to do with that second room? I said, second room? Yeah. I thought I just had this room. Huge, big gallery space. No, the, the adjoining room. We're giving you that room, too. It was like, yikes. <laughs> okay. So right away, I thought, okay, I just thought of a giant head. I got a yeah. piece of plywood, and I cut out a giant, this face I always do with the ponytail, you know? Uh-huh. I, I just took a, I took a piece of... Uh, charcoal what's that called vine charcoal i drew the big head and the ponytail but you have to get in the doorway so i just use two sheets of plywood and where they came together kind of through here this part (laughs) i'll put this on this side of the door and this side on that side of the door and i cut out the i cut them out so it's like a giant cutout of a head and then what i put in there was the artwork I've been working on is for this next project I'm working on. What I had to date, some of the art that I did, um, some of the single panel things, some narratives, um, and sculpture. Because I've been making three-dimensional comics. I started yeah, yeah. going around. I love that. It's like I spent like all that time on soldier's heart scanning and correcting. You know, you spend 30 hours on a page and then 10 hours on Photoshop for mm-hmm. each page. Ah. Yeah. And it's so, two dimensional space just in that for a long but, time. So yeah, I was picking up saw blades and drawing pictures, on, you know, telling stories. And I was like, love that. So I had that stuff to show. I had things like, well, my sister said she had cancer and she wanted to get her hair cut before it fell out. I said, fine. And I put these things in my hair and chopped it off. So I had chunks of my hair. And so I put that on the wall and tell and write in pencil right on the wall what that was. Above the drawing I did, of, I always have this thing with my students. It's like, are you stuck to a self-portrait? So when I was so stuck with grief, when my sister died, I did a self-portrait that is so sad. So I put that above the hair. So there was three-dimensional things with two-dimensional things all around the space. I had a facsimile of my dad's work workbench. I Against the wall, I had a bunch of stuff, pictures, drawings, a bunch of his crap that my brothers wanted to throw away and I kept. And so you got this immersive feel. My drawing table was there. So you got this immersive feel that um, you were in the space, and then I had it set up that like here's here's all this this is what ins- this is inspiration over here this is yeah. this over here. at different areas where things were going on, so if you could go in there and that's why it became the inside of my mind as a, yes and then it was Carol it was Carol World <laughs> it was that it. <laughs> It was it was uh, really a bear to put together, but because it was at the college, we had a lot of student helpers. Oh, good. There you go. We made it easy. And uh, so we mentioned you were the cover story in the Cincinnati Beat. Um, also, you spoke at the Billy Ireland Cartoon Art Museum on the unique challenges of autobiographical storytelling yes. set in real time with real characters. Mm-hmm. Um, you also spoke at the Society of Illustrators. It was hard. Why was that hard? I was with Tom Hart. He just wrote a book about losing his child. So I called it the crying towel tour. We were supposed to tour and I couldn't do it. Right. I was so stressed out by that time by everything that it was starting to gang up on me. And I couldn't, I had all these symptoms. I said, sorry, Tom, I just, it was too much. And exhaustion had set in and. You know, you talked about being strong. I would have crushed somebody. It started to crush me in this year. You know? mm. So even though there was all these accolades this year, it was actually kind of a stressful year. Oh, I was a wreck. And then I was within two. I was. You could go like this, and I'd start. You know, I was this always this close to falling apart. Very fragile. Okay. Um, 
Then also that same year, you received the Cartoonist Studio Prize from Slate Book Review with fellow recipient Sergio Aragonis. Um, you also accepted the Master Cartoonist Award from Cartoonist. Oh, no, that Pro one I got by myself. I shared Sergio with um, Master Cartoonist. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, with Sergio, you accepted the Master Cartoonist Award. Yes, uh, yes. from Cartoonist Crossroads Columbus. So it's a lot. There's a lot of celebration, a lot of focus on you and a lot of eyes on you. And uh, it sounds like there was a feeling of recognition, but also stress and anxiety in a way. You mentioned symptoms. What were these symptoms? Well, I have tinnitus real bad. So it went from having one tone to five. I had uh, developed something stomach during soldier's heart and just, you'll never know because you're hunched over the drawing table mm. stomach stress so like hunching over and it's squishing your stomach in a way just you know come on i'm i'm almost 70 now okay <laughs> like musculoskeletal so long oh, oh my oh. Oh, my back hurts. Oh, this hurts. Oh, yeah, this everything hurts. just starts to hurt. Yeah, with repetitive and motion. And when you're stressed right. out, this hurts worse. Oh, no, this is... It gets worse. And oh, that my gets worse. And Rose okay. used to say, Carol, you're stressed. Go take a bath. Yeah. Well, I don't have a bathtub. I don't drink. I don't smoke. Yeah. So what are you going to do, Tyler? You know? And I'm out, I like to, I, I'm not in nature, I'm not a hiker. I like to just go outside. <laughs> well, you know, got a dog on outside. Um, it's just, everything got to me and, you know, thinking too much, it was, I was paralyzed. I've been paralyzed until recently. I've been totally unable to function. But in that came a great joy, Fab Four Mania. Fab Four Mania, which Jim, go ahead. All right, so let's 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 talk about that. That seemed almost like a a palate cleanser, a a yes, a, excitement, uh, joy, life. Such a departure. Now, were people after after the last work? Were they just? Did they say, "Oh, this is lighter"? Did they did they take it in a critical way because it's not the same? It's not the same book. It's it's a very I think you had to have this book. It would seem to me to go do anything else because you had to. I had to. I yeah. had to. And you know, who lo Beatle fans love it. And uh, people who know my work for the heavy stuff are like, oh, well, okay, she had to do a light thing. You know, it's like, no, it's really good. Have you read it? It's, if, it, well, if, it was, if I had no. been so... I have it, and you can't see it because my optics are weird, but it says... Yeah, there's a shroud of mystery over it. To Jim, yeah, 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 Carol Tyler, Comic-Con 2018. And it it's wonderful. Just, it's supposed to be... People read it, and they go, like, they get they get the feeling. They get the, ooh, the lift. You know, it's like, it is fun. It was written in my 13-year-old self from that perspective. It is exciting. It is... Um, so different. There's no like angst. Nobody gets, uh, nobody dies. <laughs> nobody is in mourning. Nobody's in pain. It's just fun. It made me smile. And, and yes. that's, and without any kind of conflict, just an easy smile. And that's, that's what it is. Um, one thing that I will, let's, let's talk structurally. It's, oh, it's like, my, this is my fab lipstick. Did I kiss your book? Yes, you did. Oh, there's your lipstick right there. All right. So one thing about it is it's structurally, there's, let's say two thirds of it is building up to the concert. And then there's the, 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 the last part is the actual concert. Which is considered that account is considered by Beatles historians to be a primary account. Therefore it has a place in the canon of Beatles, Beatlemania history. 
after well, it goes away. I, I know that you you thought maybe maybe somebody would call you, like Ringo might call you and say, hey, oh, that was- Oh, I wish you would. I wish that Paul, Paul or Ringo or somebody would call. Why don't they call? Why doesn't Paul or Ringo or somebody call me? Do you have to I'm get waiting. any like licensing agreement to to make a comic about them? Oh, I did ask Gary about that, and he checked. I, th- you know, I I put um, just because I wrote "I Feel Fine" as a chapter head, that doesn't mean I'm stealing their music, is it? No, no, no. And, I think you know, I'm I'm drawing their picture based on my like all the little. Half the, a lot of the illustrations, you can tell the ones I did as a mature person, but those guitars and stuff that are in there that I drew and the little stuff on the end, that's all from when I was a kid. I, I drew, I made their life-size guitars and stuff on brown paper with pastels when I was 13, you know, so... Well, one one thing I experienced I had with it was I had just just recently, um, like a, a last week I think, read uh, Dragon Hoops by uh, Gene Luen Yang, and it's about basketball, uh, and his touring with his high school basketball team, and so they're all that same age, you know, they're they're all young young people, and they're going gearing up for the final state game because they know they're going to go to the state championships in Oakland. And and the last third of the book is the game. And it's and I had I was crying in excitement at that. And it was like, I can't believe you told a third of the book being that one thing and how it worked. And then I thought back when I was preparing for this and it's the same thing. We're waiting and you've built it up and then you so deliver in the concert and that was the trick because if you didn't it the whole thing was going to fall apart right you, i had to take you with me yeah and you realize that so i wanted to say that the other thing i wanted to say is let's talk about lettering I, and i know you just were always a good you had good penmanship and good lettering but did you try to do this to look like when you were younger or or because it's such a part of the visual as much as the art is, especially when you get toward the end, you know, um, or is this, is this part recreated the, the, the concert in the red in terms of. Well, it, I wrote it in red pen in cursive in right. the, the original booklet. But the problem was I wrote, I wrote it on the page and then flipped the page over and wrote it on the back. So for technical reasons only, I had to study and practice my 13 year old girl handwriting (laughs) and do it on separate pages so that it would print. So it was legible. But then throughout the early part of the book where I'm just doing that, one of the things I'm learning from people is a lot of people don't read cursive very well especially the young kids who are not being taught it in school, which I think is an ab- is, is, is abhorrent because how are they going to read journals and stuff? And the, the historical record, a lot of it is in script. Anyway, that's my uh, in me. In, in, in French immersion schools, they teach cursive from, from first grade on. Yeah, and it, it's a, it definitely should be in there. It's, and it's, it's, it's beautiful to see. Um, So anyway, what I did was I thought, okay, the people are going to be reading the cursive account of seeing the Beatles. I need to prepare the reader with the way I lay down the text throughout the, the book. So I started making the lettering. Sometimes it looks like it's a little loopy and it leads, you know, it's got a little nerve. In other words, I softened the harshness of of lettering. Almost like they do with the Neelian fonts that where you you letter, but it starts to become cursive. So that by the time you get to the reading the cursive, I've prepared you with examples throughout the read of the early part of the book. I tried to make it easy for people. Oh yeah, no, it's 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 great, Alex. What's your favorite Beatles album? What's your favorite Beatles song? Who's your favorite Beatle? Here we go. Well, that's hard. I mean, they, each one has its own story. Um, like the White Album is kind of like that. After they 
kind of made their big splash, but they were kind of going to split. But I kind of like what's going on that. It's a little more somber. Um, Sergeant Pepper's is like this big creative explosion, but lightning round. You got to say, you got to say know. one one album <laughs> song. I guess, and... I, I guess I like Rubber Soul because they were just about to find. I love a Rubber Soul. I love and, Rubber Soul. And, yeah, uh, and they were just about to find a footing, but they hadn't quite yet. And uh, I think I like Rubber Soul the most. And favorite Beatle? Um, you know, it used to be Lennon, but I think McCartney probably did most of the heavy lifting. So I think later on, McCartney became my favorite. Boo! But okay, that's that's fair. Um, I'll do mine because you get to close this with with yours because yours is more important, Carol. But I would say. While My Guitar Gently Weeps is my favorite song. Bless George. Yes. I know. Um, I would, I'm going to go with the White Album because it's the one I wrote around in my MG Medjit with my eight track of the White Album and listened to it singing everything as loud as my voice could go. So I'm going to do it for that purpose, not because of any intellectual thing. And Lennon was gunned down on my dad's birthday and now it's a day that is both it's just it it, it marred it forever um in in some respects so that's that's mine yours me yep i love them all equally like my children ah right it's hard to pick it is like <laughs> it is hard i, I yeah. will not say i love one anymore la, la, la. i love them all and <laughs> i loved all of the music Right. Okay. So you're not going to get an answer from me. I, I'm. I. I can see. I. I was able to bully Alex into saying something, but I. Yes, I'm not even yes, going to try yes. with you. Um, and so you took your palate cleanser. You got that, and it went to a happy place. What is the project that that you're doing now that you've been alluding to? I am doing a book on. Morning. Ah, uh, because of all and the, yes. It's Ooh. taking me into places I thought I would never go into. It's departing from my standard. I'm having a good time. You'd think with morning, uh, not, but. Um, and did you say it was going to be in black and white? Yes. Let's see. Yes. Oh, wow. Look at that. Yeah. I am I got lots of pages here. Um Fanographics doing it? I guess. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, I tried my New York agent and she said people were not in the mood for anything about death and mourning. And I thought, COVID? Okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe not. Um, so what it is, is it's a three-part book, but I don't think I'll do it in three parts. It is an exam. I don't know how to talk about it because it's about Coming to terms with the fact that we were talking about the stress, coming to terms with the fact that I've been seriously affected the same way dad was by the war. I have PTSD. I have stress from seeing people drop dead, being there at their deathbeds, something I didn't experience before. Watching people die, Rose on her kitchen floor, my mom, my dad, you know, what? My sister. Right. This was my circle of people. And not only that, but living people crapped out on me. The people I thought I could depend on crapped out. So I got to the point where there was, again, like I was in that strip with the baby. There was moments here, maybe that terrible year was part of it, where there was nobody I could turn to. My therapist quit. Nobody I could talk to. No place to go. Where are you going to run to? So I was here in this space with everything that happened. 
And then my daughter, who had moved out, was living with this guy I could not stand, a different guy from the one she's, she was with. Anyway, she was with this guy who was from India. And uh, it looked for a while like she was going to be getting married and living there. And I was just like, I, I would have nothing left. How would I ever access even my child? And we were so at odds, I didn't even speak to her. And so one night I had a, it felt like, <laughs> that's why I have the head into at the gallery. I felt like my head split open. It felt like when an iceberg shears off on one side, I thought, oh my God, I'm having a stroke. I got up and I was walking through the house and I started to see that I was in a different world. And I started to see characters and I started to understand that something was being revealed. I was having like a vision. I don't know where it came from, but something happened in my brain. And I entered a different world. It has never happened to me before. I wasn't afraid. It's just, it was like I had, oh, I had a big reveal, almost like I've been on acid or something. And then this idea of telling the story of, you know, I said, oh, okay, I'll just tell the story. It's like, no, I'm not telling the story. I'm not going to tell the story of these people that I loved. I'm not going to tell the story that way, the way you think. I'm coming here. So this place that I, my brain entered into, I came to figure out after months of asking the people who were revealing themselves to me, do you think I'm a kook yet? They said, no, this is Griefville. Lady, you're in grief. This is Griefville. And the guy who was saying it was going, this is grief. grief, 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 grief. I said, could you say, it? why don't you just call it grief town? Wouldn't it be easier to say? You're in Griefville. Grief. Everybody comes here at one time. So then I started to look at grief and mourning and how we don't do it well in this country. We don't do it well at all. How did they do it in the past? I started examining my own emotional life in terms of that. You know, what, what, what's going on? The whole funerary ick. And then I started to think about the toll. I started to think about the people. And then I went to, you know what? If I'm going to tell their stories about how these people died, I ain't telling it. I'm going to find some Griefville citizens to do that job for me. So I've been mining characters. I've been talking, you know, I've been working through these steps. I've been setting things up. I've been getting ready for the end of the book, which I'm not even going to hint at because it's really crazy and wonderful. Uh, it's, it's, it made me feel like now then, now you're going to step up and be a storyteller. You watch. I, I just have to say, I disagree with your, your agent for sure. Cause I can't think of a book we could use more than that right now. I mean, it, it that's, that's what we need to do and to understand it while we're doing it. We've come out of COVID. We're not going to be done thinking about what happened. No. And no, they, that's exciting. That somehow has it together in terms of death and death rituals. No, we don't have it. And our own mortality. So are we so talking a year from now? Or, a? I mean, in terms of release, do you think? A year? More? Um, yeah, because, I mean... I think I'm done with the big reveals. I got the hunks of the book that I need, but you know what I'm having now are clarification thoughts, you know, like, okay, I think it's best if you have this be here and this be here and this be here. And this, but I had that. And then like two years ago, I created the map of Griefville, which is this grand scale thing. It fits across a whole wall. It's like, oh shit. Now I can't scan that. I'm going to have to break that down into pages. If it's going to fit in a book. Nobody likes my landscape formats, so I'll have to go big. Is it going to be oversized? That means I've changed the scale of my lettering. I mean, there's a lot of technical stuff like that. 
do people want to spend? It's going to be an expensive book, but it's like it's going to be this gigantic, awesome thing. I mean, as I sh I've shown a couple of people, just like, am I crazy? Is this on gear? And they're like, no, I, I, I like this. <laughs> this and is very like, exciting because I, I have not read about the, like, I feel like we are, um, so we're ahead of the game on this. About, I've been talking about it. See, here's my house. Two pages. Here's one side. And here's the other side. And I explained this whole thing because not too long oh, after this, a man comes and oh, I'll just tell you. Um, so this whole this whole story, this whole thing is I, I went to black and white because you know, life and death. And I also went to yeah, black and white because we'll talk about 2030 if it's in color. <laughs> it takes forever. So if I just do the black and white, maybe I can, you know, snap through it real quick. But I'll tell you what, I'm learning more about black and white. I love black and white. I love working in black and white. I love what black and white is telling me again about marks and how to make marks and how to do things, you know, the way, the way I uh, failed maybe to complete the last time. So I'm, I'm really trying to get like, be a pen girl. Come on, be a brush girl. Just go black and white. Do it. And I'm enjoying that. Well, Alex, um, as as a divorce lawyer, if it's it's time to go, or I'll be getting a divorce. Oh, get get done with that already. We could go on for hours, but we're not going to. Oh, here know, we go. So it, the title of the book is the Ephemerata. The oh. ephemerata. I am so excited about this. I think it'll be fun. It, Especially when I've come up with a great hook for the ending. People are going to love it. Oh, that's awesome. That's cool. They're going to love it. <laughs> They're going to love it. Keep them people happy. <laughs> All right. Well, um, well, obviously, this can go on for hours more. But... Um, and we are going to keep uh, an eye on on your future projects, and uh, and Carol Tyler, thanks so much for joining uh, Jim and I today on the Comic Book Historians Podcast. It was a truly esteemed pleasure. I'm so glad we could go through the timeline of your life and your career, and you're very emotionally open and willing to discuss so much. Jim and I may travel there and visit, <laughs> and uh, if there are no horses, I can ride on Jim's back. Uh, wild there's life. horses. We got yeah, but, we got horses. There's cows, snakes, skunks. Oh, cool! You love cool. it there. Yeah, nice. But you yeah. can ride me, Alex, anytime. You're okay. not heavy. Okay, good. Thank. I'm gonna get that sound bite. I'm gonna use that later. <laughs> um, all right. You guys well, are great. This has well, been so much fun. Oh, awesome! Oh, thank, thank you, you so it was, much. It was, it was fun for us too. I'm. I'm. Uh, I'm grateful for your time. I know Jim is as well. Thank you again. So long.